vote for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network. I need your help to get to the year 1985. You're listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Welcome, Fade to Black, Bespoke Radio, for the masses. Uh, Yeah, man, how you doing? Today's Wednesday, Wednesday, June 1st, 2022. This is going to be an amazing night. Get ready. I would like to welcome everybody listening all around the world, all across the United States. Hither and thither, to and fro, back and forth, up and down, east and west, north and south, far and near. This is Fade to Black for KJCR, the Game Changer and UnX Networks. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. What is cracking, everybody? How you doing? How you doing? Tonight's... We welcome very special guest. John Burroughs is here. We've we've had two very important weeks covering the UFO hearing. And tonight we're going to continue th- that uh, with uh, John. A lot to discuss. I want everybody to get ready. A very important show. This is a not to miss show. Tomorrow night is Fader Night with open lines all night long. All right. Now, I uh, I got my hair cut today. I'm heading out of town uh, this weekend. And uh, I got my hair cut. And, uh, and, and <laughs> here's the deal, man. I had this, you know, about an inch and a half cut off. And, and I got in the car. And, <laughs> and I was like, nothing happened. <laughs> What did I just pay for? And uh, but it's it's lighter. I feel I feel more handsome. And uh, so there you go. So yeah, I'm fresh, fresh. Got my hair cut. Got a clean shirt on. I took a breath mint. All in preparation for John Burroughs, who will be with us at the bottom of the hour. Last night we had Billy Carson on the show uh, discussing the Black Knight satellite. It was an incredible show, and I really enjoyed it. And um, uh, the the tour that we're doing in Egypt, uh, Billy and I were talking about this earlier today, uh, is sold out. And that's coming up uh, this October. But I will be, and this is why I got my hair cut, I will be in Detroit this weekend for the world premiere of Billy Carson's new film. It's called The Black Knight Satellite. That is Sunday night, June 5th in Detroit. And uh, now people always say, man, you guys only do stuff, you know, in California. You know, there's nothing ever, you know, what about the rest of the country? What about, well, here's your chance to come and hang out with Billy and myself, red carpet, Q&A, the whole thing, the pageantry. Come and hang out with us in Detroit and and make your plans. Uh, There are still a few tickets available um, and they are uh, right below us in the description box, also over on our website and in social media. So come and do that. And then coming up in uh, just two short weeks, right here in Los Angeles, California, I will be hosting Disclosure Fest. It's a one-day event, June 18th, uh, from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. at the Los Angeles State Historic Park, right here in downtown Los Angeles, right next to Chinatown. And just go to DisclosureFest.org for tickets and information. This is a huge event, and it is so much fun. 
all right, we got music, we got presentations and and everything else going on on 16 or 18 stages. It's uh, it's incredible. It's a huge event. So come and hang out with us, all right? All right, everything that I'm doing is in the description box below right here if you're on YouTube. I don't know if you're listening or if you're watching, and if, if uh, you're not there, then just head over to our website. Everything is there, and also in Twitter. You can follow me on Twitter at J Church Radio. The Sandbox is hashtag F2B on Twitter. It is right in front of me. And there you go. Now, I've got a lot of breaking news. Um, Now, earlier today, I saw the post. I didn't watch it yet. But I understand that there is a 30-minute interview uh, with uh, Tim Burchett and Lou Elizondo uh, that hit the internet today. I haven't watched it, so I can't really comment. I'm going to watch it tomorrow. Um, But did everybody see it? And I would love to uh, hear uh, what your thoughts are on that. Now, let's get to the breaking news. Elon Musk. Man, I haven't done Elon Musk news in like 10 days. Elon Musk is demanding that Tesla office workers return to in-person work or leave the company. The policy was disclosed in leaked emails Musk sent to Tesla executive staff yesterday. Now, here is a quote from one of those emails. Quote, anyone who wishes to remote work must be in the office for a minimum, and I mean minimum, of 40 hours per week or depart Tesla. This is less than we ask of factory workers. The office must be the employee's primary workplace where the other workers they regularly interact with are based. Quote, not a branch remote office unrelated to job duties, end quote. Earlier today, when asked on Twitter, hey, Elon, any additional comment to people who think coming to work is an antiqui- uh, an- antiquated concept? Musk replied, they should pretend to work somewhere else. Incredible. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm with Elon on this one. <laughs> I am. I'm 100% with Elon on this one. He can do what he wants. Earlier today, now... This this story, this breaking story, is out of Canada. Are you ready? Earlier today, Canadian regulators found that Tim Hortons, that's right, that popular fast food chain, coffee and donuts, changed its mobile app in 2019 to track and collect sensitive location data on its customers. An investigation led by Canada's privacy commissioner found that with the help of a U.S. company radar, Tim Hortons was able to collect data on its customers' location as often as every few minutes. Regulators found the collection described as continual and vast ultimately served no legitimate purpose and was not proportional to the benefits Tim Hortons may have hoped to gain from better targeted promotion of its coffee and other products. The government investigation into the company began in 2020 after a journalist at the Financial Post claimed the Tim Hortons app had recorded his GPS coordinates over 2,700 times in five months. The tracking occurred even when the app was closed and not in use. Holy crap. Admiral Linda L. Fagan shattered the military's glass ceiling earlier today to become commandant of the United States Coast Guard and the first female officer to lead a branch of the U.S. Armed Services. Incredible story. Now, archaeologists in the UK recently had their eyebrows raised. Now, if you have if you have kids listening, cover their ears. I know this is a family show. I normally don't go there, but this time I have to. 
That's because archaeologists in the UK recently had their eyebrows raised when they discovered an X-rated carving on a stone at a Roman fort. The graffiti features a crude penis accompanied by a phrase that experts translate to the shitter. And all of that was next to someone's name. And it seems to have been etched out by a Roman soldier to insult a comrade. The stone, which is 16 inches wide, yes, and six inches tall, absolutely, was uncovered May 19th at Vindolanda, the ruins of a Roman fort just south of Hadrian's Wall, fortified structure that served as the northern frontier of the Roman Empire. Archaeologist Dylan Herbert, a retired biochemist from Wales, unearthed the stone during his second week at the excavation site. Yeah. All right. NASA, today, big announcement. Kaz, I knew you would post the picture of the penis stone. There it is, everybody. Just go to, you can follow me on Twitter, uh, or you can go to hashtag F2B. And uh, you know what? I'm just going to retweet this and call this the penis stone. I just said penis like five times. I've never done that on this show once. <laughs> but there it is, everybody. Follow me on Twitter, and you can see it yourself. Thank you, Kaz. Kaz is quick when it comes to X-rated Roman art. And there you go. All right. NASA, earlier today, selected Axiom Space and Collins Aerospace to advance spacewalking capabilities in low Earth orbit and on the moon by buying services that provide astronauts with next-generation spacesuit and spacewalk systems to work outside the International Space Station, explore the lunar surface on the Artemis missions, and prepare for humans' missions to Mars. Big news today. They look cool, too, by the way. Well, everybody knows about the big the big breaking news from earlier today. Because a jury has found both Amber Heard and Johnny Depp liable for defamation in their lawsuits against each other. The jury awarded significantly more damages to Depp, by the way. A legal win for the actor. The jury found that Heard defamed Depp in three separate statements in the Washington Post piece that was the center of the trial, and that Depp defamed Heard with one statement that his attorney made. The jury awarded Depp $10 million in compensatory damages and $5 million in punitive damages. The jury awarded Heard $2 million in compensatory damages and no money for punitive damages. Punitive damages, by the way, in the state of Virginia are capped at $350,000. So the judge reduced the punitive damages awarded to Depp. Incredible. Now, I didn't I didn't watch the trial. I didn't have the time. Plus, I don't have actual TV, right? I've just got all those apps and, and streaming services. So I don't have any live news or anything like that. But I got to tell you, I don't know how many conversations I have had with friends on the phone from around the country. I'm like, uh, so what are you doing? Uh, watching uh, the Johnny Depp trial. Right. <laughs> really? I mean, it was like everybody that I knew uh, was watching this trial. I I happened to miss it. I, I kept up on it, but uh, I didn't see the action live. All right. Let's get this show cracking on this day in history. OTD 1967 The Beatles release Sgt Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band The Beatles eighth studio album that would become regarded by many as the greatest in the history of rock and roll Just 10 years later the world got Van Halen I'm just saying Fader fact All right Here we go You know what every single day when I get to the fader fact, I think to myself, this is the best. This is the greatest fader fact ever. They just get better and better. And today, it's like that. Here's your fader fact. In 1991, Orestes Lorenzo Perez, a Cuban military pilot, 
defected to the United States in a MiG-23. That's right. We all know the story. But then, in 1992, a year later, he piloted a Cessna 310 back to Cuba, where he landed on a crowded road, picked up his wife and sons, and returned back to the United States, landing in Florida. Total time on Cuban soil? About one minute. And that is your fader fact. Tonight, we welcome very special guest John Burroughs is here, continuing our UFO hearing coverage. Uh, one of the biggest days, uh, I think, in, in history. And it went down on May 17th in Washington, D.C. We're going to be talking about that and much more tonight with John. Tomorrow night is another fader night with open lines all night long. Now, I'm going to hit this River Moon coffee. Mmm. Rivermoonwellness.com. John Burroughs drinks Fade to Black Blend. He knows what time it is. Skyhawk just tweeted, great movie. So I guess he did his homework. I told everybody to watch The Disappearance of Flight 412 last night after the show. And he says here, he says, great movie quote from The Disappearance of Flight 412. It seems to me that you got to sort of take a scientific approach to this. Either you prove these things exist or you prove that they don't exist, but you don't pretend they're not there. Great movie, Jimmy. Thanks. I'm telling you, that movie, was it 1974? I thought it was 1972. Man, Glenn Ford, man. <laughs> Glenn Ford. You know, it's one of those movie roles uh, before I move on here. You know, Glenn, who's been in such, you know, huge movies and such a big star and a big actor, and you get that script from your agent, and you're like, okay, well, it's a paid gig. All right, I'll take it. And you don't realize uh, what a great film it turns out to be. And it's uh, and same thing with David Soul, right? But uh, it's a great movie, The Disappearance of Flight 412. I got a bunch of email today from you out there that uh, did go and see the movie, and you all agreed. That, wow, I didn't know I didn't know about this movie. And you're right, Jimmy. Wow, it's a, it, it is. It's a great movie. All right. Uh, I wonder if Burroughs has seen the disappearance of flight 412. All right. Rivermoonwellness.com. Promo code F2B blend, fade to black blend, the best coffee in the world. Now. I am often asked. Like, in a lot, right? What is my favorite all-time UFO case? I get it all the time. I'm out. I'm at a conference. Somebody comes up. Hey, Jimmy, it's great to meet you. Great to meet you. You know, we're from, uh, you know, we're from uh, uh, Michigan. Okay, cool. Hey, Jimmy, I've always wanted to ask you, what's your favorite UFO case? Right? And it, it just happens all the time. I'm doing interviews, and, and it, it, it comes up. Right. And, and I get it. And I understand the interest. And I always answer pretty quickly. You know, and I kind of, I, I, I throw a little acting in there. I do a little Marlon Brando and, you know, throw some acting in and a dramatic pause. Like I've got to think about this for a second, but the answer is always the same. Rendlesham. Rendlesham. Now, Christina Gomez and I will be discussing this in depth tomorrow on her show, and and I can't wait for it. And it's it's it just doesn't get the coverage that it should. And it has been investigated, documentaries, TV shows, talk shows, radio programs, books. It's been investigated from every direction for the last forty years, and that that part is is pretty pretty solid. But it's just not enough. Rendlesham is that important. And, it, and it's that important for, for many, many reasons. Now, my interest in the case uh, started with some light reading in the early 90s. I had heard about the case. I had seen some stuff on TV and then the internet starts to roll around and I'm on different, uh, like Paranet and I'm on these different UFO groups and I'm, 
searching and I'm doing my thing, right? And then I'll, I'll never forget it. I was I was home. I was alone. And back then, now I'm talking about 1995, like right in there, right? The internet really hasn't happened yet. I don't even think Mozilla or whatever, whatever those other search engines, you know, <laughs> were, I don't think they were invented yet. And you had a AOL, but there were ways to get on the internet and search things. And I um, find, and I don't even remember how this happened, but I find the audio recordings that I had heard before but never had a chance to really analyze. Um, I got to uh, Colonel Halt's uh, tape recordings on the net. And remember, back then on the net, getting audio on the net, getting a JPEG on the net took forever. And we're talking about yeah, people today, they just don't get it, man. You have whatever 5G on your cell phone and you can stream whatever. But back then, to get a picture to load, you had to wait for like a minute and a half. And it, tink, 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 you go and get a drink and go and do something, come back, and hopefully the picture is now on the screen. It was like that. And so audio was rare, but I found the audio files and I don't even remember how this happened, especially back then with the technology, but I got them saved and I was able to play them back. And then I got the transcripts and I'm listening to the audio recordings. Uh, this is all in one day and I've got the uh, transcripts. Now that was in the afternoon. It's now late at night and the lights are dark and I'm home alone and I'm listening to these tapes and, and reading the transcript over and over again, visualizing what is going on. And then going back and listening to Penniston and Burroughs and Halt and, 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 and things and, and, and trying to really understand what these three days were. But one thing is for sure with um, this being a military case, number one, and number two, that the three main, everybody's still alive, but the three main, Penniston, Halt, and Burroughs, are still with us and can still share their information and their experience with us. That's what makes Rendlesham as important of a case as anything that we have right now in all of ufology. There's that. Then there's all of the other players. You have that. Then you have the fact that this is a military case, that we have Bent Waters and Woodbridge, uh, two, uh, two air bases that are uh, touching each other over in the United Kingdom. You have the paper trail. You have the debriefings. You have, uh, you have a flight line. You have ammunition. Some say that there was nuclear weapons that were stored there. That has still never been confirmed because there's not supposed to be any nuclear weapons from the United States in the United Kingdom. So we're there. Don't know. But all of this plays out. And this went all the way through the Ministry of Defense and the United States Air Force and continues to this day. The, the case is so complex, and the, the memories and the recollections from everybody um, that were there, generally speaking, have remained consistent for 40 years. I think memories um, have been recalled. People are remembering more. But you have so many different people involved that not everything is exactly the same. But the, the event itself and the... And the, the basic part of this story and, and how it went down have remained consistent. Then we have the Halt memo uh, that uh, he prepared um, where the rest of the paperwork and everything else had uh, was uh, collected and written up around Rendlesham um, throughout the United States Air Force. Where that is today, I don't know. Um, but I think it exists. 
And I and I, I said this last week, and I brought this up on the show, and I'm certainly going to speak tonight to John Burroughs about this, who will be with us in just a few short minutes, that I think that that Halt and Penniston and, and Burroughs need to be called as witnesses for their testimony. If the uh, if the House of Representatives, if Congress, if if the Senate um, and the United States, uh, the the task force, um, if the UAP task force, if they want to focus on the military aspect of this and calling witnesses, and that, that's what they want to focus on in that data, then you have Rendlesham. It can't stop at 2004. It just cannot. And and right now, we have the ability to bring both uh, uh, Burroughs, Halt, and Penniston as witnesses to one of the most important cases in the history of everything. So that's why Rendlesham, to me, is important. And what we are going through right now, certainly with the hearing from last week and John's insight on that and what he felt about it, and, of course, moving forward, there are going to be many hearings, and I think one of them should focus on Rendlesham. So that's my take tonight. John Burroughs is with us. I'm going to get his opinion, his thoughts on everything that has gone down over the last week. It has been an incredible ride. Tomorrow night is Fader Night with open lines all night long. I'm your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer and Unex Networks, Race Hobbs. This is Fade to Black, and I will be right back with our guest, John Burroughs, right after this short break. Stay with us. This is Nicole Church, daughter of you know who, and you're listening to Fade to Black on JimmyChurchRadio.com and the Game Changer Network. You're listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the X. You're listening to Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. Fade to Black will now pause for alien identification. The station that talks the net. Introducing the Game Changer Blend from River Moon Coffee that delivers a customized blend made specifically for the Fader Knots. If the game is rigged, change the game. It's a bolder cup with some bite. Game Changer is the coffee of choice for those that prefer an organic dark roast that is slightly lighter and milder, but it's still dark. With wild notes of pecans and chocolate with a rich, balanced, full-bodied cup that is roasted to perfection for a great coffee to start your day. As an after-dinner coffee or anywhere in between. Artisan, small batch, roasted to perfection. USDA certified organic, all River Moon coffee is freshly roasted and packaged in the USA. Just go to rivermooncoffee.com or click on the banners over on our site and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Rivermooncoffee.com. This is the only way forward. This is Made to Black. Make contact. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you can get our podcast for just $2 per month. All you have to do is click on the podcast banner over at jimmychurchradio.com. Do you have an interest in the paranormal? Then you'll love the unxnetwork.com. The X is your streaming audio and video for everything supernatural, strange, and mysterious, like UFOs, Bigfoot, ghosts, and so much more. From hosts like Jimmy Church, Whitley Strieber, Micah Hanks, and Christina Gomez, visit the unxnetwork.com show page for a complete list of all the paranormal programs you'll find on the X. 
Be sure to follow us on Twitter for updates at KUNXDB. Follow our Facebook group, UNX Network. Find the podcast on Spotify, iHeart, Audible, and Apple Podcasts. It's time. It's new. It's the X. Nine out of ten geneticists agree. Fade to Black is not your father's radio show on the Game Changer Radio Network. Hi, this is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This is Kyle Massey, and you're listening to Jimmy Church Radio. All right, welcome back. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. This is Fade to Black. Tonight, John Burroughs is with us. We're going to cover uh, the UFO hearing. I want to get his insights and what may be going on also behind the scenes as our government appears to be moving one step closer to disclosure. He entered the United States Air Force in 1979 and served 27 years, both in active and reserve. The most notable assignment, of course, began in 1979. He was assigned as a security police law enforcement patrolman, where in the early morning hours of December 26, 1980, while working a law enforcement patrol at RAF Woodbridge, he had a life-changing event where he conducted an investigation on a phenomenon which has left the rest of the world in awe as one of the most documented and witnessed sightings by the United States military in known history. Of course, we are talking about the Rendlesham incident, and I would like to welcome back to Fade to Black, John Burroughs. John, good evening, young man. How you doing? Doing good, Jimmy. How are you? It's, uh, it's, all, you know what, man? it's always great to see you, John. And, um, and can, I, can I just say this, because we're going to have a pretty in-depth conversation tonight. So before we get started, um, I'm a radio host. That's what I do. I'm supposed to remain objective and bring on guests and 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 stay impartial and 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 do my thing and and then move on to the next to the next guest in the next interview. But you and I um, over the years have have developed a pretty cool bond and and friendship and 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 I just want to thank you for that. And I'm just excited that when you do come on the show, because of that, we've got a certain amount of trust uh, that is uh, that is cemented between us, where we can always have a, a very open conversation. And and I think everybody appreciates that we have that ability to communicate with each other in that way. So I want to thank you for that and welcome back and just say, how you feeling? How you feeling? <laughs> How's the health? You good? Uh, up and down, but you know, it uh, it was been a rough year. Had COVID, still haven't come back from one hundred percent. But other than that, doing pretty well. Other than that, doing pretty well. And uh, the the last two years, obviously, we're not going to get into that. But it also, I think, because of my own experience, it's allowed us a, a lot of insight. You know, we've had a lot of time to think and look back and reflect. And and then we've got all these other developments that are going on right now uh, with UAPs and UFOs and and committees and hearings and reports. Um, it's it's a pretty stunning string of developments, don't you think? And and you've had a lot of a uh, lot of time to just kick back and observe. Can you can you believe what is going on right now? Well, yes and no. I mean. Yes, it's interesting that they've gotten it this far, that there is interest from Congress. They've held some hearings. But then the other part is, where have we really gone? I mean, do you think disclosure is taking place, Jimmy? I, I, am, I am shocked and happy that this conversation is happening on so many fronts. Uh, with the Department of Defense, uh, of course, uh, with Capitol Hill. Uh, with the media and with uh, some of these witnesses that are coming forward. And of course, then you have uh, the efforts of Lou Elizondo and Chris Mellon and others uh, to push this forward too. And then you can even throw Avi Loeb and, 
and the Galileo project into the mix too as well. Um, this conversation has never been so out front before. So yeah, no, I'm pretty excited. No, I, it's not that you can't be excited about it, but I think if you really get down to the nuts and bolts of it, what do people expect? What, like you're a radio host, you've interviewed a lot of guests based on your interviews and your own opinion. What do you expect to come out of this? What? Okay. So, and by, by the way, everybody, John also is, uh, you know, an experienced radio host. So that's how you turn it around. That's called the turnaround. Well played, John. Um, uh, I, my expectations right now are pretty high. Um, I think that something pretty stunning is, is on the horizon. What I am very interested in is, is how a very complex, quite possibly legally troubling issue, because this gets real deep, real wide, really quick, how, how this game is going to be played. Um, that's, there's, there's some choices that have to be made. And, and I just don't know how that's going to be handled. I think that there's some very smart people here that are looking at every aspect of, of this. And then when, when we consider, and this is the, probably the most important part, since you ask me the question, there are, uh, many, many people that have had direct contact that have had health issues resulting from that stuff that has been documented, not only in the Condon report, but stuff that is being talked about now out in the open in the Gillibrand amendment, for instance, and, and not only uh, physical uh, trauma, but, but mental trauma. And if you're going to move this thing forward, then how are they represented? And which includes yourself and your fight for this that has gone all the way from uh, yourself and your family all the way through uh, McCain's office and, and fighting with the VA and, and everything else and having your your own medical records labeled top secret, right? <laughs> and you can't, your own doctors can't have access to your files because uh, they're, they're, they're classified. Now, th this is all part of the big scope. And, and how do they choose to deal with this moving forward? I'm very interested in this. Well, there's no doubt. I mean, you, you've got the issue of Lou, you know, worked in a program. So he's got the attention of some of the people in Congress. Mellon, obviously, his position he held, he was the deputy director. I forget exactly the name of the agency other than they were the ones that that agency was put together after 9-11 to tie all the intelligence agencies together. So they worked together because one of the problems they said with 9-11 was that the agencies weren't working together and talking to each other. So it's clear that both of them have had access to certain things. But just as we move along, I, I just have to ask you and bring up a few points. Today, Lou did an interview with, I think it's Bouchette, isn't that the congressman out of Tennessee? Yeah, Tim Burchett. Okay. Now, in the interview, he started with saying that when he took the job, he was counter intel, which you have to ask a question from the very beginning. Why would you put somebody from counter intel in a UAP position? Number one. And that, that hasn't been looked at very hard. But number two, he claimed he didn't even know what the job was at first. He said in the interview that moving forward after talking with people, then he started to realize what was going on. So why would you take a guy that has no clue about any of this, this counter intel? And has it ever been established? Was he enlisted or was he an officer? That's has a any, question. That's a, that's a question for Lou. Um, right, but has that ever been established? Because I've never heard if it has or not. Yeah, I mean, when uh, the when if, if we back all of this up and and we go back to four years ago and we look at his original uh, resignation letter and who it was addressed to um, at at that point um, he uh, he appeared to I mean. I, 
I, I could be wrong, but almost a contractor. Was he a part of uh, a, a branch of the military at that point or the State Department? Um, that's a that's a question for Lou. But the other part is this: his prior, you know. So what was he doing uh, around the world? Was he in a branch of the military or was he working for the State Department? So yeah, that 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 I don't know. And uh, everybody's really looked into this. Um, but I will certainly ask Lou. Yeah, I'll ask. But, him. but I mean, you have to build. You have to build a scenario. So. You have Millen, you have Lou, read when he was alive, step forward. But what I find interesting is all three of them have tried to put pressure on people that have replaced them. So Reed was the in charge of the Senate. He was the majority leader at one point. And one of the interesting things about Harry Reed was, is when they gave the funding to Bigelow, which is another whole branch of this whole thing going down the path, is that as soon as he started getting data back, what was the first thing he wanted to do with it? He wanted to classify it in, a, in an SAP program, which is the most highly classified program that we have, or right. at least that we know we have. Who knows if we have something higher than that? But SAP is pretty, you know, pretty high up. And so he wanted to do that. Um, Mellon never said anything why he was in. Lou didn't. Now, he did resign. But he never really did explain to me, and maybe I missed it. He made it sound like they weren't taking him seriously, but he never said who they were. And he never really, you know, said how much he really learned on all this other than their stuff being hidden. But if you look at it, what, why, do, why does he, Mellon, or Reed when he was alive, think that the people that replaced them are going to have to handle this any differently than they did. They didn't step out and do anything when they had a chance to make a difference when they were still in government. Sure, sure. Well, let me ask you this, because, I mean, although that is an interesting point, um, I would have to ask you why, though. Why would you look into that specifically? Is it because of Lou's position now uh, working uh, to, uh, to get these hearings to happen? And, and who he is working with behind the scenes. And is this a concern? I mean, why why bring this point up? It's, it's a valid point. It's but- a valid point because, number one, if you think about it, what's changed? Well, I mean, I, I understand there's some people in Congress now that are showing interest in it. But what's changed that's going to make the people that replace them do anything different than they were doing? They're, they've already clearly stated the Air Force is not cooperating. Right. That was one of the things that Mellon wrote about after the hearings. The Air Force is still not cooperating. Yeah, it was a great article. That was a great article. But right. but 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 when you say what has changed, I would definitely say, and and again, you're the guest, so I'm gonna I'm gonna throw this right back at you. This will be the next. This is the double turnaround. Okay. <laughs> but what has changed is we had a UFO hearing on May seventeenth. Right. And and that hadn't happened for 54 years. So that has changed. I think what has changed is that the politicians, the elected officials that not only fund these programs, but are supposed to be in control of and knowing every aspect of what is going on, not, not only with law, but with the military and, and adversaries, foreign and, and domestic and everything else. It, it is their job to be able to have the answers so they have the tools to make decisions on how to move forward. And they are not getting any information. That has also changed. They're enjoying the same frustration that us in the UFO community have been yelling about for 70 years. And and so, yeah, I think that is a, that is, that's a big drastic change. That's well, huge. Is it really? Because let me ask you something, okay? I'll bring up one of the things that caught my attention in the hearing. Um, I forget who asked it, but okay, can I one- just tell the audience this has now turned into a John Burroughs Jimmy Church phone call? This is, <laughs> this is, this but, is what we do. Okay, go ahead, John. But you had a congressman, and I forget his name. He asked them point blank, have we gleaned any, you know, weaponization or technology that we're we are either utilizing or trying to utilize or learn about? from the phenomenon. And 
that was one of the quickest answers from, I forget which one of them answered it, simply saying we need to take this behind closed doors. Right, right, right. And uh, that was Scott Bray. The, um, uh, I, I think that, now Ross Colthart was on the show with us on Monday, and he brought up just about the exact same point that you're bringing up right now. That one of the questions, uh, uh, he said the first question that he would have uh, a representative ask one of these witnesses is, are there any uh, crash retrievals, parts, technology out there that have been distributed to the military and to private corporations and who did it go to? Right. Well, isn't that basically what that question was? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's, yeah, it, but but what was their answer? Uh, well, we'll have to get back to you on that. We'll go back to we'll go to closed doors. Right, 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 right. Which right there, okay, that is probably the most important question that was asked through the whole hearings, and you didn't get it. You they didn't say one word. All they said was, "We'll take it to hot behind closed doors." Now, that was a subcommittee. So those guys aren't the big boys. And what I mean by the big boys is, is that the you have to understand how Congress works as far as the committee chairs of the ruling party are the people that get the highest level briefings, okay? Which, in essence, you don't even know what they're told. You don't even know what briefing they get. You don't even know you know, what they're being asked about or what they're being asked for. So one of the first things that came to mind with me when they, when that question was asked, which was a good one was we'll take it behind closed doors. So, but that goes to the other point of what happened with me when I had all my stuff go down, McCain got directly involved at one point and got pretty deep into it. And the guys that were behind this that were working behind the scenes with me trying to get in, get information to him and trying to get him to understand what was going on as soon as i got my settlement they went straight to him and his committee for funding for exotic technology most people probably have forgotten that or don't even know it existed those dia papers that became that were submitted to congress and the committee came from the very people that I was working with behind the scenes about my whole, the incident in my whole case and all the exotic technology that is either on still on the blackboard. Some of it's probably in R and D maybe some of it's operational or about to become operational. Did you um, let's, let's talk about the hearing itself uh, before, because we're going to get uh, pretty deep on some subjects here in the next uh, couple of segments. Um, were Bray and Moultrie, uh, for you, were they the right witnesses for the first hearing? Well, a lot of people think so because it was, they call it the warm up. You know how you're in the bullpen warming up before the game starts, right? You know, you're a baseball guy. So, you know, they're the bullpen guy, the bullpen catcher and the whatever they're down there and they're warming up the audience. But so fair enough. Number one, number two. There really wasn't too many hard driven questions, which kind of surprised me because it, it, this is not coming from me. This and this is not private conversations, but just what's in public record. Mellon and, and Lou and some others have been kind of prepping these guys. So why was so many softballs thrown? Now, do you think they okay? Um, now I don't want you to speak for Lou. But when you say prepping, do you think that the prepping was for the representatives to ask the right questions or the prepping was for the uh, the witness testimony and their answers? Well, th that's really, there hasn't, can there hasn't. Can you prep both, both teams? Well, yeah, but see, the witnesses haven't come out yet. This is basically, they've been up on the hill. This is interviews that Lou's done, so I'm not divulging anything you know, that's been privately said. And Mellon and these guys have been up there talking with these guys in Congress. And between the article from the New York Times, then you had, you know, they've been up on the Hill. They've been talking the, to these different representatives. Why, why didn't they work with them to ask some really hard-nosed questions? Did they try? 
that's never been asked. And did they get did they get stood down, or did they even work on that? And if they did, why weren't some of these questions asked? Mellon put out, I think, the night before or two days before, he put out what questions should be asked. And realistically, there was really nothing that was asked other than the technology part, which I found intriguing. You know well, what I mean? Yeah, okay. So as you were watching, there was some ebb and flow. Uh, there was some there was some strategic moves that uh, definitely were being played out in front of everybody, and it was only 90 minutes long. But I felt that Bray and Moultrie uh, were thinking that they were going to be able to telephone this in, that this was going to be a quick in and out. And and they didn't take it seriously. And the, they tried to put the focus at the beginning, after Andre Carson's opening statement, um, they tried to put the focus on uh, China and Russia and drones. And they tried to drive that the first half of the hearing. And that didn't work. And the second half of the hearing was definitely uh, moved to ET, extraterrestrial, and stuff that was not of this earth. Did you did you get the same vibe? Well, okay. When when they came out, my my take on why they didn't show anything more clear, you know, the videos and stuff, mm -hmm. was because there this was going to be taken more seriously by the news media now, because you're having a hearing, so there's a different type of coverage taking place when there's a hearing on something over just different people and sound bites, you know, and stuff like that. So they didn't show certain videos and stuff, most likely because they didn't want to pique the news interest in this. So they did a good job of t tapping down the interest of the news media, number one, because there really wasn't much offered. And what little was offered was going to be taken behind closed doors. So, and, and I don't know, no one's really commented. How long did that hearing last? Yeah, I haven't heard yet, and I know that uh, uh, that uh, John Greenwald is definitely working on uh, FOIA release, uh, you know, the notes and the minutes of the briefing with everything else extracted, you know. What, what do they call it? Means and, and techniques or whatever, the, you know. Well, so, no, it's just basically redacted. So they'll redact yeah. anything that's classified, and that's what that was. It was a classified hearing. Yeah, so there's yeah. a good chance that most everything that's been stated in the hearing will be blacked out. Probably even who may have showed up. We don't even know if they brought somebody else in behind closed doors that was higher up than them that testified to these guys. Yeah, that's right. And now uh, I asked you if Moultrie and Bray were the were the right you know witnesses to bring first. Um, what would you like to see in in future hearings? Who would you like to see? Uh, come up and testify well you can parade across military guys um you know what they saw um obviously you can use some of the video but most of that's not going to be used because most of it i mean do you believe what little we've seen is all they have they've got probably hours of it they're not going to show our means or our capabilities and whatever whatever's taking place you know so they're not going to make that public um they're going to basically tap this down with national security. And that was one of Mellon's points. Is there a balance being done between national security and what the public deserves to know? Right. You know, and, and the point is, is that we can't get past the fact right now that there was no answer or question, really. There was no question, first of all. So there was no possibility of an answer. What, what do you have any idea what we're dealing with? Is it from here? Um, because the closest they got to that was, what are we learning from this? Now, I'd like to know why he came up with that question. Who got him to ask that question? Because that question is basically premises that they're here. We know what they are. What, you know, we're studying them. And are we trying to learn their capabilities? And that wasn't a no. It was, we'll talk about it behind closed doors. And I know I keep going back to that, but that's an important issue. No, it is an important issue. And and and, and let me tell you why. Um, and we'll, we'll pick this up after the break. But uh, Representative Welch um, literally said, John, it's a big universe. Now, what I want to know is, 
there's a lot of life out there. What I want to know is, is E.T., are extraterrestrials visiting this planet right now? And and Bray did a little bit of a dance. And, uh, and then Welch came back with, okay, well, you don't want to answer that now in the public side of things, but are we going to address this later on this afternoon in the classified briefing? Right. And, and so, yeah, it's back to your point that uh, these issues about ET and extraterrestrials, you know, the real meat of this matter, uh, every time it was brought up uh, specifically with Welch, it was going to be discussed in the classified briefing. No, correct. And that's, that's where I'm going with this. So yes, kudos to Mellon, Lou and others that have, got this to into Congress has there's been at least there's been one hearing. We have no idea how many more there will be, but the first report was that not mostly very short, very sweet. And there was no meat to the report, right? The public report. And I believe there was like nine pages, but there was another nine or 10 that were classified. So once again, the, the meat of the report, was again not released to the public now what i want to talk about uh when we come back after the break uh when chris mellon uh did his rant i think it was in the washington post i could be wrong um one of the things he said in there uh very directly is that the united states air force who probably has the most to offer is the most silent and uncooperative was was that the same vibe you were you were in the air force for a very long time was there any uh was there any pressure uh from command to make sure that nobody talked about ufos ever well i know we're coming up on a break what i can say is this our case was never supposed to be made public and it was then the air force it's kind of like what's happened with these videos. The Air Force then could no longer deny that the incident took place. You had an official memo from a United States colonel stating that an event took place. But I got a phone call because I was now on my third base from Bentwaters, or was it would have been my third base, my second base since Bentwaters. Um, after I went to public affairs and let them know CNN wanted to talk to me, I got a phone call the next day and I had to go into battle staff on a secure line. And I spoke with Brigadier General in charge of the uh, public affairs at the Pentagon and a particular officer that had been at Bellwaters at the time and now was in public affairs. And what they told me was this, and, and I'll make it short and sweet, is number one, stick with the HALT memo, which wasn't factual. And number two, um, we don't want to make it look like a cover up, but we don't want you to discuss most of what took place, just stick with the HALT memo and answer any questions off the HALT memo. So if you looked at the memo, the dates were wrong. It was all put together as one. If you didn't, if you weren't there, if you didn't understand what was going on and what took place, you would have never known the right questions they asked, number one. And number two, you would never have known how to follow up with FOIAs and requests and documents to support the incident itself. You know, so yeah. that's something that they're very good at. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We'll uh, we'll continue this uh, when we come back after the break. Our guest tonight, John Burroughs. This is Fade to Black. I'm your Jimmy Church. We're talking about the UFO hearing. Took place on May 17th in Washington, D.C. All of that and much more when we come back after this short break. This is Fade to Black. Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network. Your one million gigawatt paranormal powerhouse, KUNX DB, VX. 
This is Billy Carson, founder and CEO of ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. ForbiddenKnowledge.tv is the fastest growing and one of the most watched networks in the world. And I would like to personally invite you to check out our expanding library of TV, film, lectures, and special presentations. ForbiddenKnowledge.tv has over 6,000 videos covering lost history, health, UFOs, spirituality, and our future. We are committed to our community. And with my personal invitation, you can right now get your own free 30-day membership at ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. Knowledge.tv. Your own library of information starts today at ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. Because you never got that pony you always wanted. <laughs> Damn it. Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network. Listen, I know and you know that you've always wanted your first crystal skull. Or maybe you're a collector just like me, but you just don't know where to go to find the real thing. Then I met Carolyn Ford over at EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com. Carolyn is the guardian of Einstein, one of the most respected ancient crystal skulls in the world. All of her unique skulls have been imprinted sitting with Einstein in his sacred lodge and are carved from the finest gemstone and materials. Imprinting is the process of receiving the ancient wisdom from the master skull or master computer. Einstein, the ancient crystal skull. To see Carolyn's current collection of crystal skulls, just visit her store at EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com or click on the banner over on our site. Don't forget to use the promo code JIMMY at checkout to receive 10% off of your order today. That's promo code JIMMY. Finding your first or next crystal skull is easy. Just visit EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com. Hi, this is Ray Sobbs here repping the planet, and you're listening to my good friend, Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. This is Toby Kebbell. You're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Don't hurt me, Jimmy. I'm only little. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And this is Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. <laughs> We're of the Honey Brothers. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And I'm Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. And you're listening to Jimmy Church. The Revolution. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you can become an official fade or not by just going to our membership section at jimmychurchradio.com. Hello, this is Serena Wright Taylor from Conscious Life Expo, and you're listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church, who holds the Lucky Pony record for the best astrological chart since 1963. True story. This is Micah Hanks of the Graylian Report, and you're listening to Jimmy Church on Fade to Black. <laughs> Welcome back, Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, our guest is John Burroughs. And uh, let me get this uh, sent out. Okay. All right. Hey, hey, John, check your private chat. I just messaged you. All right. Our guest tonight is John Burroughs. Tonight we're talking about the UFO hearing. Took place on May 17th. Um, uh, a little more, John. A little more. I don't know if it'll go much more down. I don't have the expensive stuff. Uh, is that better? Okay. Uh, no. <laughs> well, that's it. it is what it is. Okay. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, Another point, I want to continue what we were just talking about before we move on. Another point that Chris Mellon uh, pointed out uh, about the Air Force. He had said that there was a, a private and secure chat room set up at the Pentagon for the different branches of the military to get together and talk about UAPs and incidents. And that uh, the Air Force got wind that some of their personnel were in this chat room and they told them to stay out of it. And and I thought that that was pretty interesting, which is 
uh, which is in line with uh, the Air Force's attitude about this, that they're not going to volunteer anything and they're going to keep everything to themselves. Um, and it's been that way since uh, the close of uh, Project Blue Book. Were you surprised to see Chris Mellon uh, put this in writing? No, be- because think about this, Jimmy. Who got the the grand grandmother load or who just got awarded probably the future? The Air Force. Space Command. That That's our future, okay? They're, this is the fifth branch. And they're, it's not really tied to the Air Force directly. But it's being run through the Air Force, their chain of command, through NORAD and everything else. So they have they probably do have most the most secrets. Never mind. Most of if you go back to the laboratories, you go to Area 51, Wright Patterson, um, the laboratory down in New Mexico, um, Los Alamos and all that, that's all Air Force. Then you have Kirkland. You have all the work on the technology, M technology, radars, and everything else. So the gist of what's taking place, what's been worked on, our advancements in technology go through the United States Air Force. Not the Navy, not the Army, not the Coast Guard. So you're that's correct. They would have the most information and that just shows you that it's locked down, that they're not going to play. Now, the next question is, is who's going to make them play? Right. Which is my next question to you. Who's going to make them play? And and do we need do we need a UFO czar? You know, do we do we need somebody that has the power to uh, to communicate with the NSA, with the CIA, with the FBI, with all the branches of the military, and possibly with uh, private corporations, uh, to go and get this information, not only to the UAPTF, or whatever version uh, it is called today, but uh, get this information back to the Senate Intelligence Committee? Well, first of all, you'd have to believe, and this is where there's issues, though, too, because you have elections, p- different parties take control. So you change chairmen of the committees, you know, and they retire or they don't get reelected. So first of all, you kind of, it's really difficult to trust a lot of this stuff to these guys because they come and go. And each time one leaves, then you've got to bring somebody else up to speed. So and then how does the person being brought up to speed, does he get the same briefing that the guy did before? What is the person's connections in that runs these committees? Like for McCain's sake, he'd been around forever. He knew everybody in D.C. He went, It was military background. So it would have been really hard to pull the wool over his eyes. And unfortunately, he passed. If he hadn't, I think there'd be more going on with the hearings than there are now. But it would take a guy like McCain to stand up and start pushing buttons. But this is where the control can come from, money, okay? And this is one of the reasons why I'm bringing up the technology and it's going behind closed doors. And you have to question Lou and Mellon because of their tie to private corporations, including Justice and Skunk Works, and the fact that Danny Sheehan said this, I didn't, Lou is still a government contractor working for Space Command. So if that's true, if that's true, then he's working for the main organizations holding back the most information. Well, and, and, and uh, certainly, uh, you know, I can't speak for, for Lou or, or Danny Sheehan or or the other players that, uh, that statement would have the most uh, weight applied to it. But, I don't think that uh, Danny helped the situation uh, from any front by by making this kind of information public, you know. And and it's it, it's weird. If it, you know, I know Danny. Uh, you know Danny. I've known him for a very long time. But um, as an attorney, I think sometimes you just need to you know button it up and and not necessarily. Uh, I don't I don't think it really helps the situation. And and to that end, John. Um, I feel that, and this is uh, this comes from the statements from 
uh, the Pentagon, the United, uh, the UAP task force, and of course the Senate, um, and the way that this is being moved forward, that the focus is on the military. So if the focus is on the military and, and testimony from the military and the security of our skies and, and our borders and our, our men and women in service, of course, um, if that's the case, has somebody reached out to you from Washington? Shouldn't they want to speak to you and Penniston and Halt? Well, I can't speak for Penniston or Halt, um, but I have had some conversations about possibly going up on the Hill, you know, meeting with some people in Congress um, and possibly getting taken to other places. But the reason why, and it's not so much Rendlesham, and don't get me wrong, you know, going from 2004 forward, makes somewhat sense because you have the videos. Right. So you have documentation yeah, the backing, backing up, but backing up the testimony. Okay. Right. Right. But right. when you go back farther, you just have testimony. You don't have a lot of, you know, information to back up what people are saying took place or didn't take place. In Bellwater's case, you do have the halt tape, which is like you said, a very, very interesting thing to listen to. But in my case, the interest for me solely has to do with my injuries and the fact that the government tried to cover it up, that I wasn't even in the Air Force when the incident took place. They've classified my medical records. And it took McCain, his aide, mostly his aide, because people, a lot of people think these congressmen and senators are the one doing the work. The majority of the work is done by the staffers. Right. And and they use the weight of the senator or congressman to get the, the job done. But they're the ones that do the heavy hauling and the work. But in my case, it got so ridiculous that a deal was struck and then they rescinded it. And that's when he really got involved and basically stated that if something isn't done quickly, there he may have to open hearings about the whole incident itself. But all along, which was interesting, it came from Kyle's office. It came from McCain's office was there's no doubt something happened to me. There's no doubt an incident took place, but I will never get the answer to what it is. I'll have to be satisfied. And their goal was to get me the care I deserved, but I'm not going to get any answers of what took place at Rendlesham or how I was injured as far as what injured me. They were just going to get me the care I needed. And my settlement, which there's been different people question it, but I've done some speaking engagements, including the MUFON one last August, where I've shown documents to show that my settlement was based off the fact that I was injured in the line of duty during the incident. Mm -hmm. That's where my that's where my injuries came from. Now, they did not state what injured me. They just stated that they agreed that I was injured and my injuries came from what happened at Rendlesham. But you, Jimmy, well, let me let me ask you really quick. Um, have your medical records uh, been declassified? Do you now have access to everything? No, no. And th there's an interesting story about this that I I I don't want to say too much, but way back before the the thing started after ten when I got sick, there was a researcher that wanted to get some of my records because what was taking place. What I was saying took place wasn't what Halt was saying take was place. And he wanted to look at some of my records to back up the set fact that I said I got sick right after the incident. Mm -hmm. And so he did a request for my records and they denied it because of, I didn't know if HIPAA existed then, but they, I don't know when HIPAA came into play, but they denied it because he didn't should, what they weren't going to give him access to my records, but they did tell him if I signed an affidavit, um, I'm saying who I was, and it could be verified as far as, you know, with the affidavit and notarizing everything, they would release the records to me. And then I could choose to do what I wanted with them. Well, we sent the paperwork in and it came back tonight, said I wasn't who I said I was. <laughs> they exactly, it's exactly the wording they use. They said, we don't believe you're John Burroughs, so therefore we're not going to give you your records. Now, right then and there, I knew something was going on. But later on, when we made the play for the records, I'd seen them about, oh, what, about seven years prior at Luke Air Force Base. 
And the reason what I mean by seeing them was when I went to get my records, they had them divided into two separate folders. They had the stuff from early on and separate. But when I was, my name was up front. And when they pulled the thing open, I could see the records from, the, from when I first came in. So the records existed. Um, they, they told um, McCain staffer, Cheryl Bennett, that, you know, that first they came back and said I wasn't in from 79 to 81 even though we had proof I was. And it took somebody up at AFRPC to certify records behind the scenes that I got to, to prove that I was. So then they turned around and said, well, we'll give you a generic DD form 214, which they did. So I, they didn't give my true DD form 214 and it's not even accurate. There's mis things wrong with it, but it did show I was in in 79. So then they were willing to work a deal out, but, in the book that I wrote, Cheryl talked about it. They actually pulled the deal high up and she actually went to the Department of Justice on it. And they said, well, there's nothing we can do about it. Whatever he was involved with in his records are classified. So therefore yeah. we can't talk right. about it. Yeah, that's uh, uh, those pages in the book are, are fascinating to read uh, her version of uh, what she had to go through. Fascinating. Um, oh, OK, so would you. If if either Congress or or the Senate um, asked you to testify, uh, would you? Well, first of all, you'd have to bring Cheryl up there, number one, because she handled all this stuff behind the scenes. Oh, OK, that, that, that's a great point, because that's actually what the question is about. Right. What right. if they wanted to talk about? Uh, uh, OK, John, what did the UFO look like? Right. What if they wanted to have a line of questioning like that and and not necessarily go directly at uh, the VA and what you went through? What if they wanted to know about the incident itself and, and what you and 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 Pettis did and, and and what happened on the on, on on the little hill? You know, what what if they wanted to know that? Would well, you be willing to talk about that? Well, yeah, but I'm on public. There's more than enough testimony that I've done over the years and stuff that I've done that could easily handle that. And I'm not against these pilots that they're going to bring up there, maybe. But all we're doing is all we're doing is telling them what we saw. And that's not going to get them anywhere uh, because it's at the end of the day. OK, there's enough testimony there not just the Bentwaters incident, but many other things that have happened to include 2004 going forward with these videos that show there's something in the skies that can't be explained and that there has been encounters by military personnel with what they now label UAPs instead of UFOs. But that's when you really have to start getting down and dirty. That's when you have to get people that have studied this. And they won't even admit that publicly that they've studied it. They won't even admit that they've they're trying to gleam information. The closest they've come to that was a British document called Condine, yep. which they went into the fact that it needs to be studied. It should be studied. Then I went forward and did a FOIA with them, which is in the book. And I asked them point blank, just like they did at the Cong congressional hearings, are you or have you been working on technology gleam from UAPs? And I got, I got the answer that would have been interesting if they would have done it on a TV was, and it's in the book was yes. As far as it's all classified, we can't talk about it. It ties up in the different divisions. Why we can't talk about it to include the industrial complex part of it, where they're, they're working on it. Then it also would, it would uh, benefit our adversaries to know what we've got, what we're working on. So I did this a long time ago. You know, in fact, I was the one that got the government, the British government to admit they were holding back documents. They'd said they were finished. And based on what I learned and some of the stuff I got from inside and some documents, I was they admitted they were holding back documents. And then they admitted to me that they were studying the phenomenon and they actually are working on technology that has to do with the UAP, whatever that is. Well, okay. Now, um, I want to come back to Condine, and and you and I have referenced together um, a certain section of Condine that that I thought was the most, uh, I mean, eye opening uh, statement on UAPs ever. We'll we'll come back to that. But if 
you heard what Gallagher said and his questions when he, he brought up Malmstrom. And both Bray and Moultrie looked at each other and, and said that they have never heard of Malmstrom, right? And then he brought up the Wilson Davis uh, uh, memo and that they had never heard of that either. What if Gallagher or, or another representative would have asked about Rendlesham? Would you expect Bray and Moultrie to, to know about Rendlesham? Probably not because... Again, what did they emphasize? They're looking 2004 forward. So that's a real easy out because right. if, they're, if they're not looking at all the cases, and again, remember, Rendlesham is, every case has its own, you know, own story, but the real story is the technology behind the case. So they may very well have gotten some information about Rendlesham, but not been classified Rendlesham, the case itself. They may just have been briefed on technology that we're working on. Yeah, you- and, and you know, and, and Malmstrom, see, this is, and this is my point, John, that Malmstrom is 1966. Okay, all right. So maybe you, 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 you're not aware. I don't buy it. You know, it's nuclear missiles and, and things, but okay. Uh, the Wilson Davis memo. All right, you may have to be listening to Fade to Black every night to, to understand what that is. There are members of this community that still don't know what the Wilson Davis document is. Okay, so that's fine, too. But Rendlesham is part of not only the military, but part of popular culture. And everybody is aware of Rendlesham. So I, I would be surprised if they said, no, I've never heard about Rendlesham. Uh, well, the, the well th- no. that's a that's that's lying by omission, Jimmy. Oh, right, you, right, right. You could right. actually have heard Rendlesham, but you've never read any documents on Rendlesham. <laughs> you see, that's that's the way you can get around stuff. Sure. And there, and they weren't there to talk about Rendlesham or Maelstrom. They were there to talk about what's flying around in the skies. And th- not only were that was what the objective was, but they they even just did a real piss poor uh, presentation of what was flying around in the sky. Well, yes, and okay. So back, let's stay on this though. Okay. One of the things that Representative Schiff, who's the chairman, right? That the, he's the chair. Uh, Schiff said, "Are you guys only interested in investigating low hanging fruit, the easy stuff, the easy stuff to investigate? What about the stuff that is more difficult to investigate, like Rendlesham?" Or maybe even Malmstrom. You know, why aren't you looking into these other cases? You're just looking at the stuff that you can easily go in and and try to identify and close the books on. What about the other stuff? And that's why you and and Halt and Peniston need to go to Capitol Hill. Well, I don't disagree, but Jimmy, do you, do you really think? And I'm going to bring up an example of what what I mean. Um, do you really think they don't already know what we're dealing with? They have a pretty good idea. Oh, they and, do. And one of the interesting things is, and again, I'm going to go back to Lou, because he said it. He said publicly in an interview that we're tracking UAPs with satellite technology. That's right. Okay, so I'm not crossing any boundaries. I'm just stating what's been made public. Oh, and Cliff Radcliffe, Radcliffe said it too in in an interview. Former CIA director. Well, how how do we know? How can we track them if we don't know how to track them? If we don't understand what they are, if we don't understand the frequencies, satellites just don't hover in one area unless there's a reason behind it. They're sure. constantly moving, right? right now. Now, there's a difference between spotted UAPs on on satellites and tracking them and seeing them uh, approach this planet. Yes. Now, uh, now let's talk about frequencies because we're going to get into this a little bit deeper uh, when we come back after the break. Back to the Condine report. The one paragraph in there, and I remember when the report was released and, and I read the entire thing and I highlighted a couple, I immediately got on the phone and called you. And, and I know that you remember this conversation. We've talked about it before, but I said, John page number, blah, 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 blah. It says right here 
that the frequencies involved uh, causing injuries are known to UAP reports uh, uh, in the past. And it was, you know, I'm paraphrasing there, but they clearly said that they know about these frequencies and that these injuries have been reported. And this is something that is known about UAPs, Condine's words, not mine. Well, I can kind of add something that's interesting to that. I'm Before General Williams died, now you had said that everybody was still alive. Actually, General Williams is gone, unfortunately. And he would have been very important to this case to go up to Congress and talk about it. And he was very close friends with McCain and got him some information that helped my case moving forward. But when, when I sat down with him and I handed him the Condine pages, that was one of the pages I, I sent, get, handed to him. And his comment was he never thought this stuff would see the light of day. Right. And then the second part was, he goes, do you have any questions? And I said, yeah. Let's go to these frequencies. And he popped his head up and he looked me straight in the eye and he said, I'm a fly-by-wire pilot. He go, I go, sir, the last time I talked to you, you got an engineering degree. You know darn well what this is saying. He goes, nevertheless, we're done talking. You've, you've ran out of questions. And that was on the first question. So <laughs> he he was well aware based on what happened happened after Renderson. He worked at Norton. He was in procurement technology and stuff. He he knew the importance of those frequencies. And one other thing to add before we go to break, and I'm sure we'll talk about Kit Green and how put off a little bit because they played a part in this. Sure. That terahertz radiation plays a part in this, and no one knew what terahertz radiation was until my case went pu more public and Linda Moulton Howe introduced it on Coast to Coast. And also some other stuff that she talked about that night that I just had my surgery the night after that they wanted Linda to know about and make public. So this has been a long process by these guys, some of them behind the scenes more. They're trying to get at something. The question is, are they really trying to benefit mankind or are they just trying to benefit technology, which could benefit mankind? I'm not saying it won't, but are they really sincere about wanting the public to really know what's going on? based on their background in national security and their clearances, or is this just a power play to get contracts to, to develop this technology? And you'd have to get Congress on board to, you know, to allot this, this funding. You Let's know? take our break right here. Our guest tonight, the one and only John Burroughs is with us. You know, when it comes to Rendlesham, it's as important as it gets. John's view and insight and interest into the UFO hearing is paramount. Let's listen to his words. More with John when we come back. Stay with us. Way out here, we listen to Jimmy Church. You're listening to Fade to Black. You're listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the X. ¿Qué tal mis amigos? Yo soy Mario Carlson, el tiburón, y los invito para que escuchen mi buen amigo Jimmy Church Radio. Claro que sí. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and this year, June 18th, 2022, the Disclosure Fest Foundation presents the Mass Meditation Initiative. It's Saturday, June 18th, from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m., one day only, at the Los Angeles State Historic Park in downtown Los Angeles, California, right next to Chinatown. I'm hosting the event again this year with music performances by Trevor Hall, the Desert Dwellers, Poran Ki, and many, many more on four separate stages. There's 16 stages in total, over 30 acres in downtown Los Angeles with vendors and tents and presentations and workshops with Billy Carson, Adam Apollo, Lori Spagna, Laura Eisenhower, Brad Olson, David Palmer, and many, many more. It's all simple to do. Just go to DisclosureFest.org for all of your tickets, information, and a full schedule of the day's events. Again, DisclosureFest.org. 
Do you want to be an official fade or not? Of course you do. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. Just go to our membership section at jimmychurchradio.com. Fade or not, when you think about the future of our country and where we're headed, do you wonder about the food supply? I do. Disruptions in the food supply chain could be disastrous, and they usually occur with little warning. That's why the smartest thing you can do today is to stockpile emergency food, water, and other essentials. I personally recommend My Patriot Supply. They're the nation's largest emergency preparedness company, serving millions of customers for more than a decade. In fact, they're the only source my family trusts for our preparedness plan. You should too. Right now, save 20% off a full four-week supply of delicious meals that provide 2,000 calories a day. Saving 20% helps too, doesn't it? especially now. So go to preparewithjimmy.com and get ready. That's preparewithjimmy.com. There's no time to lose. Do it now. So you love talk radio, then you'll love talkstreamlive.com. Talkstream Live is always on 24-7 with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. You listen to us, and we listen to you. And so does the CIA. (laughs) You are listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Oi, oi, I'm Reese Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is Revolution. The Revolution will not be televised. The Revolution is on radio. Ciao. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, John Burroughs is with us. Always a great conversation when John is here. We're talking about the UFO hearing, and uh, I'm going to get straight back to it. Right before the break, uh, John, we were talking about frequencies and and terahertz specifically. At the end of the hearing, uh, I could have this wrong. I don't have my notes in front of me. I think it was Adam Schiff. um, Brought up frequencies and communications. And if uh, there was an effort to communicate with these objects, and if we knew what those frequencies were for, for either control or for communication, I found that a very interesting and perfect question to ask. Um, Do you think we have a lock on uh, with what these frequencies are? And, uh, you know, there's all this conversation about terahertz and electromagnetic uh, frequencies involved with these uh, different UAPs and UFOs. Um, do you think that the Air Force is aware of what these frequencies are? If you look at Condine, they identify some of it. I mean, some of that report is still classified, as far as I've been, as far as I was told. But you just have to look at, uh, and you know, and there's so much that we could talk about on this. But you have to go back to looking at what Gary Nolan and Kit Green were looking at, the mind itself you know, and the effects UAPs have on the mind. Well, why would you want to, you know, know the effects on the mind unless you were trying to figure out, was there communication? You know what I mean? Right. You'd have to, you'd have to ask, well, one of the questions was, or what they were looking at was, what was the mind that way prior to the interaction or did it happen after the interaction? But they were looking at, you know, the effects on the mind. They were looking at the effects on DNA, you know, as far as how it affected a person when they got close to it. Um, 
they they openly said they were studying over a hundred people. Well, that means there's been at least a hundred interactions, you know, confirmed interactions with UAPs as they call them now. Um, so yeah, I mean, the funding is being allotted. I mean, it's this being looked at. DARPA is working on telepathy where you can communicate with each other without you know using a radio or anything. Um, they're working on being able to transport yourself from one place to another like Star Trek. There's so much that's out there that they're working on. They just haven't clarified how far they've gotten with it. But yeah, of course, the frequencies make a huge difference. You know? the, um, uh, the, the other part to this, um, which is it seems that now I don't have all of all of the facts and and I don't think any of us do at least uh, in the UFO community that the Tic Tacs involved uh, these UAPs with the Nimitz incident certainly had access to uh, the cap point and and where uh, Fravor and and Dietrich where this cap point was identified for them in in their mission and and they were there waiting for them. Now, that would indicate either uh, some type of uh, communication uh, with uh, Fravor's systems, right? And the systems back at the Nimitz that these Tic Tacs suddenly had access to, um, or there was something else going on uh, with the mind, like going back to what Williams told you, I'm a fly-by-wire guy, right? Right, but but can I bring something up, Jimmy, that doesn't sit well with the ufo community What's but it, it's technology based okay when when our incident took place in 1980 we w when we walked out of the field both for me on night one and night three what i witnessed i couldn't explain i didn't understand it i i couldn't relate to it there was nothing that i had seen or was aware of could explain what i just saw what took place right well when you go back and look at declassified documents and you find out, and it's in the book, I keep, I do reference it sometimes, but we, we backtracked this and we went back. They were working on technology in 1980, right outside the back gate. And the lights that Halt saw in the sky were very well could have been the blue, the blue lights were probably plasmas. Now the question is, did we create the plasmas or was that a UAP which is what Condon referred to us being exposed to UAP radiation. Mm -hmm. But the also the thing was, is they were working on lasers way back in 1980 that could control these plasmas and could interact with these plasmas. Okay. So you jump forward. Remember now one of the videos, which no one's ever touched because it would hurt the case a little bit was the pilot said, dude, that's a, that's a drone. That's a whole fleet of them. Okay. And then that was it. No, there's never been a follow-up with those pilots where I've known that they've been interviewed or tried to explain why they felt they were drones. Now, fast forward to what, where they got to that point. If we were working in that area, and you have to understand that area off of San Diego, the technology we have there that we were, we have the ability to do, that could have easily been something that was being controlled from land or from other ships that they weren't even aware about, it would be like countermeasures. Okay. And what they finally admitted after this all came out, they finally admitted that the radar could be manipulated. Okay. So there are countermeasures and technology that can jam and manipulate the radars on what you're seeing and how it's going. Um, and if you've got these countermeasures that you use to throw off, sensors and radars and everything else you can also use that to see what the pilot thinks he saw and what went on so to simply say without a doubt what we're seeing isn't capable of being our technology is disingenuous because we don't really know exactly where we stand and we don't want the enemy to know until we want to use it and so a lot of this stuff that's taking place, you just have to look at the areas. At Bentwaters, it was outside a known technology-based area where they were working on technology. We've documented that in the book. They were working on it. Marconi was, okay? Then you also have 
the fact of what takes place off of San Diego down there. Lou even hinted at it in one of the identified where it was interesting. He started talking about the technology that we had there. Then they went to break and he never, they never put anything more in it. Mm -hmm. Then if you go down to the Florida area, they were operating off of, that's where all the style technologies worked on and developed. Yeah. And these are all interesting points and uh, things get complicated though. Um, if, uh, uh, you have Fravor sensors, but then you have his, his, his eyes. And, and then you have that little, uh, that little dog fight that he went in, you know, and, and this thing circling around with him before it, you know, darted off. And so if that's plasma technology or that is some kind of, well, do you remember what Condine said? Yeah, yeah. Well, when you get in, when you interact with these frequencies and the phenomenon, it affects what you perceive you see and what you're doing dealing with. It's right there in the report. Right. When people get close to this, it messes with your mind. Well, okay. Th I'm only bringing this up because this was brought up in the UFO hearing, blue on blue. And is it possible that this is our own technology? Uh, that uh, is part of uh, the United States military and contractors, and that these are blue on blue incidents. And both Moultrie and Bray said no. Yeah, but okay, they were low level, number one. Number two, they may not have been lying because they don't know. Remember, right. they didn't know about Maelstrom. Right. They didn't know about some of this other stuff. And if this is an SAP program, that's highly carp carp and penalized. I can't even say the word tonight, but and they're working on this stuff. They may not even know. There may only be a few people. That was what was interesting today about the interview with the, the congressman and Lou. He said that, you know, he believes that whatever we're dealing with could be some of us, you know, using the technology that we however we've got it from the UAP itself, you know, and he doesn't even know who they are. So when you break this down, they're, they're, these guys were low level. They're not at the high end of the, the food chain. And they, they were probably answering it truthfully, no. But who's to say what we're really working on? And do they have the need to know about that SAP program? Right. And, and, and I would say that you're at the highest level of the food chain here because of what you encountered in Rendlesham Forest on two separate nights. And we can talk about the possibility of a black program being tested um, out uh, over the ocean. Okay, anything is possible. Uh, but that wouldn't explain, uh, to me, just like with, uh, with Fravor and his, his, his vision is you and Penniston and what you guys saw yourselves sitting in the forest. That wasn't a plasma generated craft. That was a that was a physical object sitting in front of you. Again, that's the way we it was perceived by Penniston. But remember, you can't discount what that report said. It said that these frequencies can manipulate how you remember it, what happened to you, and what you saw. And that wouldn't that be the ultimate weapon. If like I, I was in an interview one time and Kevin Day was on there and he was talking about how, you know, we don't test weapons on each other. Well, just ask the guys that stood out there when the nukes were blowing up over their heads out there in the Nevada desert, you know, back in the 40s. OK, so that's disingenuous in itself. Yes, they do. Number two, that both incidents were on. They were training without weapons, but they were they were going through the training to get ready to be spun up. So it was close to real world minus the weapons. Now, what he said was as interesting himself. He said that most likely the pilots, now this is him saying it, not the pilots, that what they had an interaction with could have led to one of them firing on that object. And he said, if that was the case of what I'm describing, the missile would probably turn around and come back and blow up you know, our, our aircraft. Well, isn't that a great countermeasure just well, in itself that you would be able to have the missile not lock on to something, but they would fire at it and then the missile would come back to mama, 
You know what I mean? It blew up the aircraft. Okay, so do we there there's two ways to approach this if we look at it like this. Um, and both of them would be a huge cover up. Two things. One, things not of this earth or things that we don't understand, another advanced civilization that is living here among us, whatever it is, but it's not us, it's not Russia, and and something is here flying around in our skies and checking us out. I either that Right. Or B, that this is technology that is our own. And in this very complex situation that would have to take place, which is testing from a, a government contractor, Lockheed, Raytheon, whoever it is, um, uh, unannounced uh, to a carrier battle group, um, unknown to the servicemen and women of that battle group that could be put in harm's way. I mean, think of how, how crazily this could have gotten out of control and, and accidents do happen. And that would be a cover up that would be huge. And, and nobody has leaked it yet. Uh, is it possible to keep that kind of testing with the battle group and ongoing Chad Underwood, um, the Roosevelt, uh, where these incidents are ongoing, um, how can you keep that a as a cover-up? I and mean, that would be a bigger story maybe than E.T. is here. But is it a cover-up, Jimmy? I mean, again, what is national security? That's the biggest holdup on all of this. But the point being is this. I firmly believe, based on Condine, the reaction I got from the MOD, the reaction in the hearing to the question that, there is some kind of intelligence out there um, and they've now decided to call it a UAP, which may be valid because of what a UAP is. If you go into Condine and they do describe what very possibly a UAP could be having to do with frequencies and the interactions with it. So then what the FOIA I got, which is in the book, the question, the way it was answered in the hearing is we're, we are working on technology based off of a UAP. But the question that's not been answered is, what is a UAP? Where is it coming from? And of course, they're going to hide whatever we've developed off of it. And they're not going to admit what a UAP is because if they started getting into that, then they're going the other side, whatever they do or don't know, that would open up a bigger window for them. That's exactly what the response from the MOD was to my FOIA question was simply, we're not going to tell you anything because we do have information available on this. We are working on it, but we can't release any of this information for these reasons. And what did they do in the hearing? They immediately said, we'll go behind closed doors and talk about this. Now, again, that's still a need to know. And that's a subcommittee. So they're not going to get, the high-end briefing, number one. And number two, the guys that are giving it probably don't have all the answers themselves. So um, if uh, let's, let's, let's explore this just a little bit. Um, I'm trying to get answers here. Right. Let's say that that closed the, the classified briefing is Bray and Moultrie going, okay, let's check this out. This is our technology, and we've been uh, testing it against our own uh, technology and sensor systems, and we are able to mask and spoof and, and cheat radar and create objects in the sky with plasma, and, and we're making sure that this system works with our own servicemen and women before we take it and deploy it in the field. And that's the big secret here. So let them talk UFOs all they want because it's going to throw off Russia and China. Do you really think that that is a possibility? And, uh, and th that's in 2022 with an incident that happened in 2004, that technology and uh, uh, controlling what your mind thinks and the ability to create something floating around in the woods of Rendlesham, that that technology existed in 1980? Yeah, they were working on it. Just read the book. We've cited. No, I've read the book. Yeah, and, I, and the, did we not cite the exact projects that were taking place during that time frame, what the projects were, that the fact that in that area 
they originally were working on the death ray. Then they developed radar off of that. Then they were working on EM frequencies and technology. They were working on plasmas. Andrew Pike did a book where he was working a project that they were studying the phenomenon that was in the area. And he himself openly said that they were actually blasting the uh, phenomenon to see the reactions and how it would work on. Where did they get this, um, the frequencies? How do they understand them? Why, why is so much effort being worked on EM technology, you know, and stealth, you know, and countermeasures? And they're working on cloaking right now. They're working on being able to transfer from A to B, and your body would actually have to be like Star Trek, okay? They're working on telepathy, okay? They're working on, with the quantum computers now, they're able to work on the mind itself and putting AI or consciousness into drones, okay? And because of the fact that frequencies can disrupt, when we're handling drones, one of the biggest vulnerabilities is if they can lock into the frequency that's controlling the drone, they could take the drone out of the sky, mm -hmm. okay? So what would be the next step? You would have to control it either independently, which now they've admitted that we have it. They, did, they sold some the drones to Ukraine that can hover above targets and strike a target on its own. So there is AI out there that these independent, these drones operate independently. Okay. Then you have the swarm drones. Now the Chinese have a, a craft. Now they developed that have all these drones that they can send out that would disrupt, disrupt carrier groups or airplanes and everything else. Never mind the helmet that the F-35 that they use, which, by the way, Faber admitted that that helmet was in use during the Nimitz incident, but he said it wasn't. they weren't using it that day because it caused them issues. Well, did it? Or were they using it? Um, were the issues because of what they were doing through the helmet? Um, we're working on countermeasures completely. Put off, get, it's got a contractor who's working on tanks, trying to clone, make them, um, you know, cloak, disappear. So this is all technology we're working on. Now, the big question is, is did we just magically learn all of this on our own or have we had some help? And the guys that are working on this, Putoff's been around forever. He worked on Stargate. And you ask about these projects, Stargate was created because Bearden discovered the Russians were working on this stuff and we couldn't allow them to, we didn't know what they had for sure. So we had to try to, you know, counter what they had and figure out if it was feasible or not. And a lot of money was spent on Project Stargate and a lot of these other projects. So it is, is if, if, if this is playing out as a possibility, as, as you are suggesting here, would this be, I mean, so we're talking about, not only DARPA, but but Northrop Grumman or General Electric, whoever you want to put, you know, NASA, uh, NASA included, sure, certainly Sandia, um, uh, these uh, different, uh, not only corporations in the private sector, but uh, branches of the military that have a technology that could uh, manipulate the mind, manipulate vision, manipulate radar all at the same time this is a pretty that's bigger than the manhattan project john yeah and it's been going on since before 1980 they've been working on this forever green was part of it kick green was part of that project because one of his jobs when he worked for the cia was the weird desk but also russian technology and the russians have been working on this forever they've been working on plasmas and everything else. The difference between Russia and us is we have the money and they don't. When the UAP task force states that we don't know what's going on, but we can tell you that it's not us and it's not them, right? Talking about Russia and China. That's a, that's an important deduction uh, to put in, in the pub. That's not in the classified version. That's in the public version of the report. Um, so it would be so compartmentalized and so secretive that nobody knows about this project? Well, again, we haven't seen the classified version of any of these reports. We didn't sit behind closed doors and what took place after the open hearing. But 
yeah, think about what Reed wanted to do, just what little they gleamed from Bigelow's funding. What was the first thing he wanted to do with the information, which they've never went public with, if you think about it? Why did Reed want to make that information into an SAP program? Well, okay. So, but certainly uh, Mark, Marco Rubio and the other members of the Senate Intelligence Committee have read the classified version of the report, and they have been talking to uh, the different branches of the military and uh, the different intelligence agencies. And if they were exposed to this information, there would be no UAP task force. In fact, it would be case closed. Not necessarily, because number one, you you have to understand how much information are they given. You know what I mean? How what, what they have to have a need to know, and then they have to get the people in these departments to open up to them. And what what, what what's going on here right now is pretty simple. They're not getting the information. The Air Force is not cooperating. And from what I understand, there is a a task force already working on how much of this through the IG. Because remember, there was implications brought up about the IG and looking into what's being covered up and what's being lied about. So why would you have an IG looking into what's being held back, what's being covered up? And um, who is the the go-to person in Congress? I mean, who okay. is McCain would have been when he was around because of the committee he held in the, the years he was on it. But who who can you zero in on now that would have the highest clearance and the highest need to know? Hey, OK, so and then with with all of this in this conversation, uh, let's go back to the first segment of the show tonight when you brought up the Space Force and and tracking these objects coming uh, from deep in the solar. Well, no, 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 no. They never said where they, how they were no. tracking them, uh, and they mind. never said where they spotted them. They didn't say it necessarily was in space. It could be on. It could be right down on planet Earth. Well, it be. It could be both, of course. Right. That's what I'm saying. We don't know how they're tracking them, where they're tracking them. Well, they're, what, they're tracking plasma created technology from our own military. That doesn't make any sense. It would make sense if the that what okay, you're a radar operator, you're running a satellite, and the data comes in. You don't have the need to know what it is. You you just you're just taking the data and it's getting passed down. Now, where the data goes to, the department that takes this data is the key to this because they're the ones that would know the most, they're the ones that would know what was going on. And of course it makes sense because the Soviets and the Chinese have satellites and they're tracking stuff. So they're going to want to know exactly what is picked up, what isn't, what is perceived as and everything else. And these are all things that, these are all things that the UFO world doesn't want to talk about. And if you bring it up, then you get, you get, you know, you get a cold shoulder from them. Well, everything, everything needs to be on the table. Everything needs to be on the table. But I will say this as we're going to head to a break in, in about 15 seconds. There's 50 billion Earth-like planets in the Milky Way uh, that can support life. Rocky Earth-like planets in the Goldilocks zone. And it's a numbers game, John. There are thousands of advanced civilizations that are aware of this planet, this beautiful blue gem that we live on. So some of this... Could be what you're saying, our technology, and this is stuff that we're looking at. Where where we got the technology from and the ideas, uh, is it backwards engine? That's a whole other conversation. But there are all kinds of civilizations with their own technology visiting this planet every single day. But and, here's, the, and, here's the thing I'm going to ask you, Jimmy. You said how could the government be covering up from people working the pro- the job, like the people behind the satellites, the the pilots and everything else? How have they been able to keep this secret? As far as if there's other civilizations that are here and visiting us, why hasn't it ever come out with them identifying who they are? Well, okay. 
I'll answer that question when we come back after this short break. This is Fade to Black. I guess tonight, the one and only John Burroughs. This is one of our phone conversations live on the air. This is awesome. John, you stay right there. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. This is Fade to Black. More with John after this short break. Stay with us. Hi, everybody. This is Rob Halford, the Mental Guard on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Your 1 million gigawatt paranormal powerhouse, KUNX DB. BX. Are you ready to read about true paranormal events? Unex Media publishes nonfiction books about UFOs, ghosts, and haunted places, time anomalies, cryptid creatures, and more. Just like KUNX DB Radio, it's all about unexplained phenomena. Visit www.unxmedia.com to see our list of great book titles by Debbie Ziegelmeyer, Gene Walker, Devin Listrom, Wayne Lawrence, Bill Spicer, and yours truly, Margie Kay. That's unxmedia.com. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and I only drink Fade to Black blend coffee from River Moon. Just click on the River Moon coffee banner at jimmychurchradio.com. Promo code F2B blend. This is the only way forward. This is Fade to Black. A contact. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and this year, June 18th, 2022, the Disclosure Fest Foundation presents the Mass Meditation Initiative. It's Saturday, June 18th, from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m., one day only at the Los Angeles State Historic Park in downtown Los Angeles, California, right next to Chinatown. I'm hosting the event again this year with music performances by Trevor Hall, the Desert Dwellers, Poran Ki, and many, many more on four separate stages. There's 16 stages in total, over 30 acres in downtown Los Angeles with vendors and tents and presentations and workshops with Billy Carson, Adam Apollo, Lori Spagna, Laura Eisenhower, Brad Olson, David Palmer, and many, many more. It's all simple to do. Just go to DisclosureFest.org for all of your tickets, information, and the full schedule of the day's events. Again, DisclosureFest.org. You want to know a secret? I love ponies. I really love ponies. I'm serious. I couldn't stay sane without ponies to brush. Why fade to black? Because you never got that pony. Damn it. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. John Burroughs is with us tonight. <laughs> Thanks, John. I'm going to have some nightmares tonight as I uh, as I go to bed. Man, too much to think about, man. You've got my you've got my head swimming here. Now let's let's go to some uh, some post hearing uh, comments. I know that I didn't see uh, the conversation with uh, Burchett and Lou Elizondo, so I can't comment there. But I did see Burchett's big blow up after the hearing. And he was an audience member, right? He wasn't part of the committee asking questions, uh, but he was pretty inflamed. And and he said uh, uh, something to the effect of uh, that this hearing was a sham, that this is a cover up on the American people by our own United States government, and the deception has to end. Uh, this is this is a cover up, and. That was a, a, a pretty extreme statement to come from Burchett. Uh, what's the cover-up? The cover-up about uh, E.T. And, and what may be going on in the skies or something else going on with our military? Well, okay. Now, the interview you did with Lou today, they, at the end they did their goodbyes, and he said he's talked to Luke quite a bit. Now, remember, Lou and Mellon have been up on the hill. 
They've been priming these guys. So based off of probably things that he's heard, you know, military stuff he's may know or doesn't know totally exists. Um, different things that Lou and Mellon have talked to him about. He didn't feel the hearings were fair to the American public. And the, the bottom line is, is that that's what we started the show with. What is fair and what is it? What did Mellon say? He said, we have to find a fair balance between what the public needs to know and what's national security based. Okay. But there's one other aspect that he did not mention and whether he's directly involved with it, justice Lou and some of these other guys is the development of the technology and where we're going. And this is the big question. How far are we and how much more money do we need, you know, in an open budget to make this work? Because we have to, some of it has to show up in a regular budget. Okay. But Jimmy, there's something we never even touched on tonight that I want to briefly hit. What happened right before 9-11? There was a hearing with Rumsfeld that said there were 7 trillion missing, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. If you did the math, Two decades worth of government funding didn't equal seven trillion. Okay. Now there's supposedly over 20 trillion they can't account for. Okay. Now the interesting thing is again, the math doesn't add up. Basically, what this implies is there's black money that's being printed that's going to these defense contractors that's off book. So it's never in the budget and it's never accounted for. And not only that, is it not accounted for, but that that they've tried to audit every other department in, you know, all the other agencies have been audited, but the DOD still hasn't went through a, a full audit and never will. So the bottom line is, where is all this money being printed going towards? And who's the biggest power play is who gets the contracts and who builds the technology? And who's you remember, you have to have individuals that study it, scientists, physicists, and everybody else. Then you have to have the people that are engineers that are going to take what they learn from this and build the prototypes, you know, design it and build it. And there's plenty of proof going on that this stuff is going on. Okay. There's plenty of documents out there to support. There's a black budget. There's SAP programs. And that there's technology that the public and most of Congress don't even know about. So uh, back to Burchett's comments, and thank you for for that. And you're right; the the money appears to have just disappeared. Um, and 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 where'd it go? And what did it get spent on? I mean, it's the budget of the world, right? It's it's the the account, the world economy is is missing, and that's that's a lot of money. But what is the cover-up of? That's the thing. What is Burchett referring to? And is Lou Elizondo and Chris Mellon, their focus on these objects in the skies, um, and, and this was a UFO hearing, according to Andre Carson, not UAP, a UFO hearing, and we know what UFO means. Now, so what is the cover-up? Is the cover-up about contact with ET or is the cover-up about black budgets and money and, and defense technology? Well, that, you, that you could add, you could add the, the, the besides the cover-up of all that, you could add the fact that they're not really admitting to anything they know. I mean, if you really looked at the hearing, there was really nothing learned from it other than, yes, we have videos. Yes. There's stuff in the sky. No, we're not totally aware of what it is. And again, depending on who you bring in, these guys were probably pretty much honest. They got what they needed to know. They, they played their role. The, the question is, is where you have to go back to is who would know the most? That's the person you need to bring up on Capitol Hill. Who would know the most of this? And that would be in the science and technology division inside these different agencies, never mind you would bring, bring in all these different um, industrial agencies that are building this technology, but there that's a whole nother can of worms because that is patent stuff. And that was one of the things that was in the FOIA request I did was they can't disclose what 
is being worked on and what they're doing because it's owned by private industry. So that's another way to hide this stuff from most of Congress, if not all of them. And, you know, by now, most of these guys, Rubio and those guys, I don't know for sure what he knows. So I'm not going to sit there and say he's out of the loop completely. But when you have this kind of interest, there's been enough given to them to realize they're not getting the full story. And they want the full story. But they haven't really said themselves how much they feel the American public should know. And how far they're going to take this to let the American public know what we really do or don't know and where we're going with all this. The, uh, the, the other part of this that, that I find uh, really strange is that uh, we do have two, three, four known incidents that uh, off, off of both coasts um, over the last uh, 18 or so years that only involve the United States Navy, that we're not getting any reports from the Marines. We're not getting anything from the Army. We're certainly not getting anything from the Air Force. Uh, what does the Coast Guard know? The Coast Guard is has got ships, you know, all over the world and certainly uh, up and down the East and West Coast. And we're only hearing from the Navy and these incidents. And I think that is something that uh, needs to be a line of questioning in these hearings, why it's happening only this way. Well, you have to look at, you know, again, I don't, there was gun camera footage from Iran, if I remember right. They right. They, they got something on camera. But just remember from 2004 going forward, there was an upgrade in the sensor systems in the F-18. So you have to have the capability to detect this, whatever this is, whether it's us, something, you a, a genuine UAP, to, or us develop the technology off of both. And here's the other question that's never been answered. Are we working? Have we been able to communicate with UAPs? And are they helping us, are they helping us develop this technology? That's a big, I'd say that's a huge question. And there was uh, one other thing that was brought up in the hearing. And uh, well, there was a lot of things that were brought up in the hearing. But I think it was Bray. Oh, oh, um, I want to go. Oh, okay. Ah, I'm going to circle back to the Nimitz. Um, I'm, I'm going to write that down. I, I don't want to forget. that. It was Bray that said that there were 400 incidents that have been reported and it seemed like he was saying since the UAP task force uh, came out with a report that they're looking at 400 incident reports. The 400 incident reports wouldn't, it, to me, wouldn't indicate testing against our military or, or our systems and, and sensor systems and radar. It's, it sounds like there's all kinds of things going well, on. Well, see, there's a difference, Okay. When you go to the Nimitz or the one off the East Coast, they were battle groups preparing for deployments, right? So that would be probably, and I'm just saying this because I'm not an expert, but if you think about it, you have to do R&D. So um, you have to research and develop it. Then you have to put it out there to see how it operates. So then you would start testing it, right? Now, What's taking place now, because you got to remember it, what, 2004, we're almost 20 years in, you know, we're 18 years past 2004 and another, what, eight to 10 years. Most likely a lot of this stuff we have is starting to become operational. Now, here's an interesting point. If you draw attention to something that people are going to start seeing, then you're going to start getting more reports. So you're going to have a better understanding of what they're seeing, what they're reporting, how they're reporting it and what it's doing so they'll be able to know how to use it better because you obviously, you know, you may want it to be seen sometimes, you may not, but there may be times when people are seeing it or being picked up by certain ways that, that you know, the technology hasn't been quite uh, tweaked the way it needs to be. And why would it start after this? Some of it could be because more people are paying attention, but this was going on before 2004, so, but you have to go back and you're going to have to break this down. You're going to, because they say it happened around military bases. You're going to have to go back and look at what we had at these bases. 
what we had where these two task force were, what we had over in the Middle East where certain things happened. You have to understand the what we have available, the capabilities. Never mind that we're we've gone, we made huge leaps in the last decade in quantum, you know, quantum computing and our ability to generate power with the, the smaller units to generate the power necessary to do this. Where before we were limited more of what we could do based off we had to have a large power source. And now these ships are working like the Zumwalk class that they only made three of. They actually showed a video at one point where it could cloak. Yeah, it's a beautiful ship too, by the way. Yeah, but it, it, they have the technology and the carriers will have the ability to generate that type of, because they have nuclear generators. Yeah, the Zumwalt, you can tell, it was designed to run in, invisible. However, they were going to pull that off. Definitely. Right. Right. Um, uh, okay. So I want to talk about Rear Admiral Daly and Rear Admiral Curtis of the Nimitz Battle Group. Um, and that I think that they should be called uh, to testify about uh, not only the incident itself in 2004, but what did they know? Where's the paperwork? What happened? And, and so forth. And if it was some kind of clandestine testing against our own military that were out there in exercises, were they aware of that? And being rear admirals of of the most advanced uh, military system on the planet, which is a nuclear aircraft carrier battle group with its submarines and its guided missile cruisers and everything else that's involved there, that they would be uh, made aware that there would be testing going on, number one. Number two, Deputy Base Commander Halt was on the scene at Rendlesham. And if there was some kind of testing going on, wouldn't the deputy base commander be made aware that this is going on outside of his facility? No, because the facility, the base was NATO and it had a mission. And oh, I wanted to clarify something with you since you brought it up. When when people claim that we couldn't have nukes at Bentwaters, that's not factual. Because this is the, what happens that people don't understand. We were not a United States Air Force base. We were a NATO base. We fell under NATO treaty and doctrine. And if you go back and look at the doctrine in the treaty, we could have nuclear weapons there under NATO command. Now, why, so, why would Hall tell me the opposite? I mean, yeah. he was adamant about that. He was like, no, 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 no. I don't want to talk about nuclear weapons. There were no. Well, we did, that doesn't just because he didn't want to talk about them doesn't mean we couldn't have them there. I'm not confirming or denying what we had there. I'm just telling you we could have and other bases in USAF and over in Europe could have nuclear weapons off the NATO doctrine. That was a whole separate doctrine um, on top of an Air Force base. We fell under NATO which most people don't understand, NATO is a whole different animal of what we do and what we don't do. So I'm just letting you know, that's right. not factual that we couldn't have nukes there. I'm not telling you we did. I'm just telling you we could. Okay. And we could have had nukes in other parts of the country too. Knock one for yes, knock two for no. <laughs> Were there nuclear weapons <laughs> at our of Woodbridge? Oh, now, now, Halt did say, I want to stay focused on the hearings, um, but I, I, I do, I, I think that Daly and Curtis, they, they need to be called to testify. If they want to focus on the Nimitz in 2004 and, and, and Fravor and, uh, and Alex Dietrich, who I think should be called to testify as well. And so should Kevin Day. And uh, and others, um, Voorhees, Gary Voorhees, but I think uh, Rear Admiral Daly and Curtis uh, that were in command, one before the other. I think it was uh, uh, Curtis first, and then Daly took over right after. Um, but I think that they should be called to testify. Um, and and then there were the statements from Halt, circling back to Rendlesham, where. I think he took things a step further. You know what I'm about to say, that he saw craft beaming lights down on uh, the weapons depot. What uh, he said was he saw the blue lights beaming lights down on the weapons depot. Yes. And then he retracted that later after he did the Robert Hastings hearing 
And I can only tell you what I was told was some of those people that testified at those hearings were uh, talked to by the DOD. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. I do know the Halt walked back some of that after the hearings, after the after the testimony he did at the the conference, you know, for Hastings. Um, what when you ask me, what do you know? No, they wouldn't know because Marta from Heath, Aria Bowsey, and Eastern Radar and all those didn't fall under our Bentwater's command. So if Marconi and the United States government were, and, you know, were working on, you know, different testing and technology outside the back gate, no, they wouldn't have to notify the base. Now, what I did was told later on, Williams was brought into the loop by Gabriel. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. I asked the general directly and I didn't get a straight answer from him that if he did find out more later. You know, it was just like the, what are these frequencies? Well, I'm a fly by wire guy, you know, mm -hmm. it, you, you get the, you get to the point where when you start getting into the meat and potatoes and stuff, I don't have a need to know. I'm not going to get to know. And he's not going to tell me, you know, and that's how this is handled across the board. And so would the base directly need to know? No. Now, did something go wrong? Maybe, maybe, or maybe they just didn't think we'd ever see it. I don't know, but I don't think the first night we, we just happened to see something. And then when we reported it, radar confirmed something was there in the area and disappeared. And we went out there. Then that led to, obviously, people started watching the woods all the time. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. so you had something happen night two. And then on the third night, when, when England showed up, according to Halt, and said it's back, that's when they sent Halt out to figure out what was going on. Now, would they send Halt out there if he was told, if they knew what was going on? No. They would have just told the the lieutenant we're aware of what's going on, just you know, because this is what happened with me when I came back off of um, break, which was Monday. I got stuck on the East Gate for three days, and they brought a team in from Langley. They were out in the woods. They were out doing stuff, and this is what I was told: you already know about something's going on. You're aware of something took place in the forest. We're putting you on the gate. And if you see anything, don't report it on the radio. Call it in on the phone. So they didn't want anybody else out there to be exposed to seeing anything, especially after it got dark. And they didn't really want people paying attention to what was going on outside in the forest, never mind what was brought out of the forest on, on night, uh, would have been Tuesday night. Yeah, and, and you guys had radios. The phone, you didn't have cell phones. There was a phone. No, it was a direct line to CSC in the desk. Right, yeah. right, 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 right. Right. Um, and when you say Langley, you're referring to uh, the CIA? The C5 came in with Langley tail number. You make it, you make of it what you want. <laughs> it went into a restricted area. Air, helicopters were, and people came out of it, and they were out in the forest. So if you go, if you look in the book, we actually have an OSI agent say they brought in every alphabet soup agency. They were out there trying to figure out what was going on. There was a discussion. It could have been the Russians. And there was some kind of anomaly taking place every time the phenomenon showed up. So that came directly from an OSI agent that was involved in the whole thing. Now, as as you've had 40 years uh, to think about this, and you, you're not going to bed. You're going to stay for overtime, okay? Okay. So do All right. um, I don't think we've ever not done overtime, actually. <laughs> um, now that you've had 40-plus uh, years to think about this, um, and I, I've – We've all heard everything that you've just said right now. Uh, where do you live? We've got Penniston and his time travelers from the future. We have, I believe, was an alien craft that came into the woods. I'm, I'm still on, on that part of it. And then there could be something else. And you had Nick Redfern's book that came out a couple of years ago. I did a show with you about that as well. Um, where, where, do you, where do you lie with the incident today where you, you know, you've, you've come to some conclusions. What, what was it, A, B, or C? Well, here's what I think, to the best of my ability and knowledge, based on declassified documents, Condine, which was declassified, and my interaction with some people behind the scenes, okay? And there was definitely, and not only in Rendlesham, but in other areas of the world, including Skinwalker, 
there's definitely a phenomenon there. Okay. And what we dealt with was that phenomenon, no doubt. But what we also dealt with was the fact that the government was aware of this phenomenon and they were doing work, research on the phenomenon. And the question is at that point, based on the stuff that we've uncovered, including the fact that they were actually beaming EM frequencies from the lighthouse into the forest area, using the tunnels to provoke the phenomenon. Um, and it's very possible they were trying to, at that point, learn how to create, you know, either control the phenomenon or create, it's kind of hard to, to understand, but if you have a real plasma or a phenomenon, whatever you want to call it, could we duplicate it? And they were already working on the ability to do that, you know? And so we had an interaction. Um, myself and Adrian Bistenzo on the third night got as close to it as anybody. Um, according to Adrian, I disappeared. Mm -hmm. I went into it and disappeared. He mm -hmm. had to come over the top of him. Mm -hmm. Now, Peniston recounts over the years has changed, but he, he tells you what he remembers. And if you go to the back to the citizens hearings, he did admit that the VA did give him some disability based on injuries, you know, based off of the encounter. But Adrian and I got close to it and we've been compensated for our injuries, for whatever we encountered. Now, the big question would be, did we encounter the real UAP? Did we encounter something we, you know, we were able to replicate, you know, or we're working on replicating or what, or was it both? Cause I was out there two different nights. So, but there is, there is some kind of intelligence out there that we're dealing with. Um, Condine confirms that if you just read the report, um, their government, British government's aware of it. They're working on developing technology off of it. And BAA system, BAE systems is part of our, you know, our industrial area too, based off of Northrop Grumman and, mm -hmm. you know, and stuff. So they're working on this. There's no doubt. So a lot of this technology that we're working on is coming from what a UAP is. Now, the interesting thing was what they were interested in me, what, how it affected my mind, my, you know, my DNA, um, what they felt I may or may not be able to do from, you know, it. Um, and one of the things that have come up to me that stands out to like, they're doing Skinwalker and they're doing some of this stuff. Do they have the right people there? In other words, if some of us really truthfully have some capabilities to attract it, are they even bringing the right people into, to these areas to see if this will show up. Because when I was in Sedona, one night when we were out there, we definitely had some strange stuff take place. Ah, man, I had one crazy night, a Friday night in Sedona a couple of months ago. Yeah. Dude. Oh, okay. I've, I've got to take a break right here. We'll come back uh, uh, for overtime. But, John, we just got – we're at the airport, you know, up on the hill. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, I mean, one minute – I barely got my jacket off and from behind us low, low, not, not, you know, this is just a few thousand feet above us around frigging white disc. And it just went right across slow, low lasted for about a minute and just continued over Sedona and then disappeared in the mountains. Went out towards, <laughs> did it go out towards Bradshaw? Uh, no, Bradshaw's uh, the other direction. Okay. This went this went uh, northeast at an okay. angle. But but my point is, what the heck was that? You know, it was like I mean, you know, we all hope for something, and and this was the very beginning. This is when we, it didn't. It was the only time I saw all kinds of crazy stuff. But that was unbelievable. I had a friend of mine, Adrian Valera, uh, was with us. And it was just mind blowing. We couldn't stop talking about it. It was, it was absolutely. Well, I, I can honestly tell you it, and I'm not trying to promote Sedona, but I lived there for two years. It's a unique place. And where you were, they, they claim there's a vortex and stuff, but you got to remember you got Luke air force base in Gila Bend. So when you ask where some of this could have come from, you know, it could have been something from down there, but 
it, if you go out over out in the Bradshaw Ranch area, there's a particular mountain, like a little bit higher elevation, an area, and you can see down in the cottonwood and then up over the uh, the haunted area, you know, the town that sits up on top of the mountain. If you go up, up over the go up over the hill, you go between Cottonwood and Prescott. There's all kinds of stuff that's always going on. Not yes. every night, but there's stuff that goes on. Yeah, what a beautiful town, too. I mean, just yeah. breathtaking. Let's take our break right here. This is Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. John Burroughs. We're heading straight to overtime. This is Fade to Black and the Game Changer and Unex Networks. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. We'll be right back with John Burroughs after the short break. Stay with us. You're listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the X. Hey, what up, y'all? It's your girl, Vivica Fox here, and you are listening to my boy, Jimmy Church, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Despite popular opinion, reading a book will not make you smarter. But listening to Jimmy Church will. This is Billy Carson, founder and CEO of ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. ForbiddenKnowledge.tv is the fastest growing and one of the most watched networks in the world. And I would like to personally invite you to check out our expanding library of TV, film, lectures, and special presentations. ForbiddenKnowledge.tv has over 6,000 videos covering lost history, health, UFOs, spirituality, and our future. We are committed to our community. And with my personal invitation, you can right now get your own free 30-day membership at Forbidden knowledge.tv your own library of information starts today at forbidden knowledge.tv your one million gigawatt paranormal powerhouse kunx db vx are you ready to read about true paranormal events? Unex Media publishes nonfiction books about UFOs, ghosts and haunted places, time anomalies, cryptid creatures, and more. Just like KUNXDB Radio, it's all about unexplained phenomena. Visit www.unxmedia.com to see our list of great book titles by Debbie Ziegelmeyer, Gene Walker, Devin Listrom, Wayne Lawrence, Bill Spicer, and yours truly, Margie Kay. That's unxmedia.com. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of fate to black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the fade to black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of fade to black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied, dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? you love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. It's not a lifestyle we chose. We were born this way. This is KJCR at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Yeah. <laughs> 
Welcome back, Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Great night on the show. What an awesome way to close out the week. John Burroughs is here. We're heading into overtime. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. This is Fade to Black. And, uh, John, what I normally like to do uh, when we get to overtime is loosen it up a little bit, have a little fun. But uh, I don't know. I I don't know how loose we can get because I want to talk about Gillibrand and the Gillibrand Amendment and what that meant uh, to the intelligence budget for 2022 after uh, it, uh, I would say that it is now law, right? Okay, so if we look at it uh, like this, there was a very specific part in there, which I call the Burroughs uh, paragraphs, okay? Where she literally, um, and you've got to think about who's advising her, uh, for the verbiage, or for the verb, or, 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 is it verbiage? Is that the words uh, that would correctly, the nouns and the verbs <laughs> and uh, everything? Um, the sentences um, were very specific and knowledge based on the subject. And in these Burroughs paragraphs, uh, they specifically cite um, reports of injuries caused by UAP. And the the health care of those that do encounter UAP. Now, I thought to myself, that's pretty specific, right? What is it that she knows? What are the incidents that are going on that we don't know about yet? We know about you and Rendlesham, but, but other cases, right, uh, that are uh, brought forward. And, of course, the VA has to get involved. Uh, But this was specifically added to the amendment. And when you read that, what went through your mind? Well, obviously that has some flavor from Lou because that's one of the reasons why they want me to go up there. Um, I kind of got, it was a twofold feeling why they wanted me up there. One, they wanted to show the fact that, that I, that there is proof that I was injured at the incident even though no one's really admitted what the incident was, what happened to us. So that would show a cover up. You know what I mean? That the government actually tried to cover up what happened to us as far as the injury portion of it, you know? So, and that's one of the reasons why I would be willing to go up there would be, and and again, I find this funny that now they're talking about immunity and Lou talked about that in this latest interview. They don't have to give these guys immunity. They just have to go behind closed doors and they can discuss classified, you know, classified stuff. They don't have to give these guys immunity for them to open up. So that's kind of misleading in itself. Now, if you want the public to hear about it, then you would you still don't have to give them immunity. Just you can just basically, as you know, the president can declassify anything he wants. So they can make whatever you testify to behind closed doors, they can declassify it and allow you to talk to the public about it. But my guess is, because what was interesting about my case too was we had, when we did the citizens hearings, the only person that knew about the classified record section and everything else was the congressman from Maryland. He was an older guy and he knew about what I was talking about and the documents I presented to the committee, they were real. And so his aide came down and talked to me and got in touch with Cheryl Bennett about what was going on. And his point was, we know about this stuff because my district is where all the secret stuff takes place. So therefore, over and over, we have people that are injured in different things that we can't get headway with until we can get the government to handle it behind closed doors or through however they want to do it. So that was one of the problems they were having somewhat with my case was they couldn't give me a total review because they couldn't have access to the documents they needed to make an, you know, an assessment on what took place and eventually it was taken care of. So yeah, there's people out there that are injured. There's people from Bentwaters that are in, that have injuries from it that deserve care. And that's what I care about more than anything. This other cat and mouse game and national security, it's fine, whatever. That's that's their business, not mine, okay? But my concern is I do believe people that have had encounters that have problems with it should be compensated and taken care of. 
And so uh, uh, and, and thank you for that, except the question was, what was your reaction and why do you think Gillibrand uh, specifically had this added to the amendment? Um, because I think they'll eventually get to that. I think they will. And I think one of the things I'll bring up is Skinwalker because, I mean, that was very stunning to me when George Knapp and um, what is it, Corbell, Corbell or whatever his name, mm -hmm. Corbell first talked about it when we interviewed him and then Knapp confirmed it, was that there was special operations brought in. So this was a government operation at that point when they brought special forces in. And they had an encounter with the phenomenon and the phenomenon followed them back to where they dispersed to, number one. But number two, some of them had injuries. So that one was not admitted to by the government as much as Knapp and Corbell stated that that's what took place. So the thing is, is that there are people that have had interactions and they have health issues. And it's really tough to get care or get compensation if they won't admit to anything. In my case, I had a hell of a team between Cheryl Bennett, John McCain, Pat Persconia, and some other people behind the scenes, you know, that helped, that got me what I needed to have to continue to be alive today and be able to function. But there's so many other people to deserve that. So no, it doesn't surprise me. But the real question is, is will they be willing to do that? Because if they bridge that gap, and they admit people have been injured by that and acknowledge it, that is a form of disclosure. Is is the altering of DNA, and specifically maybe uh, in your case, is that, uh, is that an injury? That's a good question that no one's ever asked Nolan. You know, I mean, I've had my interactions with Nolan and Green, and, you know, they've made their statements both verbally and in writing to me. Um, they definitely say my 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 DNA is unique. Um, they said that my DNA was in no database but one, but they wouldn't clarify which one that was. Yeah, what does that even mean? I remember you telling me this. Before. They 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 there's databases. I mean, people don't understand this, but when you do this DNA testing, you know this whatever they do, the different companies that do it. Right. That's all collected. And that's all they're they're doing a lot more than just telling you whether your what you know your heritage is. They're looking at DNA people's DNA. This is a major government thing that's going on. And so they're looking at DNA. And DNA would play a part in technology. How how you can, you know, the mind and the, your body can interact with technology, you know, and whether you could be inside, you know, one of these crafts uh could they create a super soldier do you know what i mean based off mm -hmm. of DNA, dna studies you know because they're they've already openly admitted that they're creating you know they're create they can create a from an embryo they can create what they want you know there's so many things that are going on right now as far as you know using the mind consciousness itself in controlling the weapons putting in an ai you know, and all this stuff is going on and most of the general public doesn't even understand that it's going on. You know, they don't even really realize where we're going and the ramifications it could have on humanity. I, uh, did, uh, did Kit Green uh, suggest to you um, that your DNA was altered? No, they just said it was unique. They and uh, and, and when one group, I mean, uh, what what does that mean? I look. So you take your ancestry dot com, right? Yeah. And then they tell you that you're an ancestor of Attila the Hun, or 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 whatever. That that everybody on the planet has got shares that DNA. Okay. So if they're telling you specifically uh, one group, what does that even mean? Alien DNA? What did, what did they suggest to had? Well, this is where, you know, it always gets blown out of proportion. This is what I was told. And again, I have no way of confirming this other than the fact that there was two ways they got my DNA. They got it when I had my surgery and they got tissue and the DOD did. And um, so they took that. And then he came back to me after my surgery 
and asked me if I would give them DNA. Now, they originally had asked me prior to my surgery, and they wanted to take blood. Well, the interesting thing was, which he would get angry with me, but I'd say, well, the database on him is the military database, number one, because they got all of this when I had my surgery, and he would just give me the runaround. But ultimately, when they asked for my DNA the second time, they just wanted saliva. So why did they not want my blood the second time? So they already got whatever they were looking for, and they wanted to follow up further for whatever reason. Probably partially, too, because now I've consented to my DNA being analyzed. Where before, because just remember, when you when you send your DNA and you've consented to have it analyzed. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, yeah. It, so, it, yeah. So, there you go. The, what most people don't know is the VA is doing a study where they're studying all military veterans in their DNA. Every time you go in, they'll ask you if you'll uh, cooperate with the test. But getting to the point is, is it was unique. According to Nolan, my bloodline goes back to Christ's time, back to the Christ timeline. And my 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 actual heritage is not what you would think it would be. I'm native. It's all way back, back to the native, way back to that type of, that's my DNA. It's got nothing to do with like Norwegian or anything like that. And so it goes all the way back to the beginning of, or Christ. And um, um, I could go a step further. Um, again, I can't confirm this other than what they've told me is that what they've said is, and I can make this more generic, is there are certain groups of people that come together. And when they come together, they create a child who then creates a new bloodline. And they said they know about this and it's taking place. So what does that all mean? I mean, I'm not really sure other than it has to do with the government's funding this. So they want to know, you know, and obviously we would tie it back again to they want to know what happens to a person when they have interactions with UAPs. They want to know everything about them after. Obviously, they can't know about what you were all about beforehand. At least back in 1980, they weren't doing it. I'm sure anybody in, you know, they have DNA samples now they take when you first come in. So right, maybe right. The, you, you can get a before and after. Yeah, for the guys that have come in. And I actually had right. my DNA sample taken back in the Gulf War. But in 1980, that wasn't going on. So there's a lot of interest in DNA, bloodlines, um, the ability of what the mind can do, you know, how, you know, it can be used. The um, actual, the bloodlines himself probably would trace back, you know, I don't know, is it alien? I, I don't know. I mean, we we can't ever even agree on how we came to be, right? You have the Adam and Me story, you have the monkey story, you know, so they're going pretty deep into this, you know, and they're spending money that's coming from the taxpayer. In your uh, regression uh, therapy sessions, um, now I know some of this has been discussed public. I don't know how far you want to go with this, but um, was Kit Green part of those regression sessions? No. Um, interesting enough, the but this again, this is something that you can't prove with documents. But the whole thing, I started smelling technology back in 1988 because when they were doing ufo cover-up live i got contacted i got brought to la i met with a guy by the name of kurt brubaker who had his own technology company he had worked for gm he'd worked for learjet and he was had a technology company and just the questions he was asking and where he was going with this to me directly led me to believe that he was looking at technology and our incident right then and there and eventually we, I got pulled from UFO Cover Up Live. He pulled me. He didn't want me in it. Um, I did the hypnosis. Then he went through Bob Emmenager, who was the early, you know, guy that, you know, now there's uh, there's new players. But he was a player back then doing stuff. Sure. And they brought this guy in who put me under. And the question, some of knowledge and what, you know, what was going on with it. And then after the after the uh, hypnosis was over, he brought in other people, including Chuck DeCaro, who was working on technology at the time, to include he ended up working with Yoda, 
which is um, Andy Marshall, who was the top think tank in technology period for the U.S. government for decades. So they were looking at technology in Rendlesham back in 1988. Was there in the in the regression? I've just got a little bit of time left, and I've never asked you these questions. Okay. Uh, during the regression, do you remember? Are you conscious? Do you remember the the session itself? After the after the after the session was over, um, not totally. Obviously, I, that was videoed, so I watched it. Right. But the thing about it was. And I'm just basing this on all the interactions I've had over the years was there were things that took place in my hypnosis that led them to believe that I had some kind of interaction with whatever UAP is. Right. And which is and, my question. It, it, so did it in the session. I'm so I'm so glad you know exactly where I'm going with this. Your DNA has been altered. You can read minds. I'm just letting you know, John. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. All right. Um, did you reference aliens? Did you reference ET and contact in those sessions? No, it was referenced to this in this way. What we were dealing with was something from the future. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it didn't really emphasize whether it was us or something else that was had come back to look at us. And the implications were something happened, you know, something happens before, you know, where they were that's affected the future. Okay. And that they were looking at this, you know, they were, they were watching, they were, they were evaluating us and what was going on. So I can only assume that maybe it was what we were working on technology wise and what we were doing. But the interesting thing was two things that came out of this. One I've kind of hinted at, one I've never said before. The one thing was they're they're going to be back for me in the future. And that really brought a lot of interest from a lot of people. The second thing was that was implicated was I may very well have been talking to myself from the future. Are you okay with that? No, but the more you look into it, if we do no, I mean, are you okay with talking to yourself from the future? Well, I, 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 the case. I, I don't, you know, the thing is, is that would that be, wouldn't that be amazing if what they've said is true, right? That we, right. we were an energy force, which is what they, we were dealing with was energy. Right. And our consciousness is part of the energy. And, and, and then we pick the body to come in, but in the, in the future, we no longer need the body. We're just energy and consciousness. And wouldn't it be cool if you could interact with yourself in the future? Because what you would learn from yourself in the future, you could implement to keep things from happening in the present going forward. Now, if I, if, if I, if I, if I time traveled, Right. Uh, you know, either contacted myself in the future or was able to do that into the past. You know what I'd be dealing with? I wouldn't deal with technology. I wouldn't deal with uh, alien. I wouldn't deal with, uh, you know, I, you know what I would deal with? What stocks to buy. That's what I would deal with, man. That's what I, that's what I, 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 I you don't want to change. You don't want to go back and kill Hitler. You know, you don't want to go back. You don't want to alter history. You just want to know what stocks to buy. Well, that's that's yeah, true, Jimmy, but they, think of it this way. Alter, you don't want to have a paradox. You don't want to melt down. I like my life the way it is right now. I don't want to go back and mess with it. So now I'm not a radio host. I don't right, right, but, 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 but think of it this way, Jimmy. You have a daughter. Does she have kids? Uh, not, <laughs> not yet. Okay, but let's just say, for example, just say your daughter has children and they have children, right? Right. As we go forward in the future, was there things that we did with technology that caused a problem that could be averted to make things better from that moment whenever they change it going forward? Do you know what I mean? That's that's all I'm getting at. I, yeah, no, and so the butterfly effect from that, though, you may do that, right? You could fix a pandemic or you could fix tech not, you know, you could, do, but what if my daughter doesn't exist in the future because we altered something else and everything else changed 
and and something else happened. Well, yeah. that's true, but but the, what I'm just use your daughter's example, the future of humanity. In other words, what it appeared to be, which was bizarre in 1988. This was way before all this stuff on the internet and everything else. Was they were concerned about something we had done that affected their future. Yeah, like buy yeah. the right stock. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, that's yeah. But you know what I'm getting at. You know, I, humanity I, I, itself and what it does to us, you know, and everything else. I don't know what to make of it. It, it this is that's just something I've never really talked about, but it was there. Yeah, that's and, fascinating. And I I've only got two minutes left. I'm gonna stay right on this. Okay. Hamilton, you know, always felt that it was uh, us from the future that he was told that in the download, right? Yeah. Well, well you, that's what, well, that's, we don't on. have a lot of time to cover it. He had a hypno, hypnotic session where that came out in his hypnosis. Right. After that hypnosis, that's when his story evolved. Right. He wasn't well, talking you, about any of this prior to his hypnosis. Were you aware of the time travel uh, comments uh, from Penniston when you had your regression. My regression was before his. That's my point. Mine and was in 1988 and his was 96. No. And that was one of the reasons why I took him seriously for a while. Right. You right. Know, I took him seriously for a while because of the regression. It was taped. What I saw, I saw the transcripts and some of the same things came out on his and mine. Now, nothing came out about binary, a download, or, you know, anything like that. It just right. simply was, there was a correlation with whatever we were dealing with was from somewhere in the future coming back to observe what was taking place. Wow, that is fascinating, man. That is and, fa I had an, and I definitely, it appears from the hypnosis and what people saw, I had an interaction with it. Absolutely incredible. Absolutely incredible. Okay, you asked me at the beginning of the show. I'm going to give you 90 seconds uh, to answer this. I can stretch it to two minutes. You asked me at the beginning of the show what I felt about disclosure and 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 the significance of the hearings and and where we are today. I'm going to ask you the same question: Is is what is going to happen in 2022? Is it what the media and the community? And everybody else is expecting that we are, we're about to have a serious conversation about ET and UFOs. Do you think that this is headed in that direction? Well, I think there's two things to bring into this. Confirmation was a big loss that was going to take place. Definitely has. The next question is how much of, how much of this is going to be held back by national security? How much is Congress going to allow this to, to do be number one, will they make a public or are they at least going to get, uh, more updates themselves and then w w how much of it will lead to funding but the bottom line is disclosure to me is they have to tell us where somebody in in authority and i don't necessarily think it has to be the president but they have to come out and admit that we are interacting with with some kind of intelligence now we'll, how, how far they'll go from there will probably cut it off pretty quick because of national security issues but if they admit there's no doubt and they've kind of done that with the video but like say for example i go up there and some other people go up there and they say yeah he was injured we we, we admit to that and yes it was by uaps now you've you're a lot closer to disclosure than you were than you were beforehand because they they're admitting that we were injured by it so that is a step closer. The next question is how far much farther will they go about what is it and what are we learning from it and what are we doing with it? John, thank you so much. And the links uh, for John's book are below all over on our website and throughout social media. John, it's been a crazy 40 years, my friend. And I hope that we get some answers here soon for you and for the rest of us. Thank fingers you. So crossed, fingers crossed, Jimmy, but don't hold your breath either. <laughs> John, we'll talk All right. tomorrow. All right, talk to you later, Jimmy. Yeah, behave and be well. John Burroughs, what a great show tonight. It was a perfect show. John Burroughs and his book, the links are, are, are below and they're over on the website, of course. And we have them on social media. Go and read the book. It's an amazing read. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tomorrow night, right here, is Fader Night. 
It's open lines all night long. Fade to Black is produced by Hilton J. Palm, Renee, Dennis, and Kevin. Announcers are Steve Harder, Gene Vito, and Mark D. Kovar. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Space Boy. Spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network. And this broadcast is owned and copyrighted. 2022 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Until tomorrow night with Fader Night, I want everybody to be safe. It's time to fade to black. Yeah.